July 17th. I'm Lori Kinnear, City Council Member Pro Tem, at least for a little while, I hope. And I'd like you all to stand for the pledge. <laughs> Ms. Farnworth, could you please do roll call? House President Pro Tem Kinnear. Present. Council Member Bingle. Here. Council Member Cathcart. Present. Council Member Stratton. Here. Council Member Post Wilkerson, here. I saw her. <laughs> and uh, Council Member Zapone. Zapone's here. Okay. Council President Tom Tom Porter runs a tight ship here. <laughs> so yeah. Council Member Wilkerson is present. I, I believe we just don't see her right away. She's somewhere. I'll, I'll, I'll yes. notate it in the record. Okay. Let Great. the record reflect that all council members are present. Okay, thank you. We have poetry at the podium online. Brenda, welcome. Does she have to hit start? Uh, Jacoby's going to unmute you, and you can go ahead. You're unmuted. You can start whenever you like. Something on our end? Okay. Brenda, we're not hearing you. Um, there you go. Are you unmuted at your end? All right, we'll try you again in a few minutes. Let's move on to open forum. And just a little bit of a agenda here. We're going to do our town hall last so we can get our very short legislative agenda done. Open forum is first, and we have done things a little bit differently tonight for your convenience. We have posted the rules for open forum on the door and then again where you sign up. Just a reminder that it is a limited open forum, so we do have rules. It's two minutes. And we ask that you treat each other with civility and respect and as well as the council members on the dais. I'm not going to go through all the rules. You know what they are. You've been here before. Um, so. We're going to start. Do you have a list for us? Dennis Flynn. Dennis Flynn, you're first. <clears throat> okay. Hi, Council. Thank you. Dennis Flynn, I live near St. Charles. Uh, as a counter narrative to some of the moral high ground assessments regarding landlords and housing, I'd like to offer a different perspective which I believe applies to many landlords. After 15 years of sacrifice by not eating out, driving old vehicles, not taking vacations, 10 years ago, we established one single residential family uh, rental. After multiple extra payments over the years, we had equity to refinance, keep it as a rental, and put a down payment on another house. This rental had been our home. Elbow grease improved and maintained as such. Knowing their difficulties, we have charitably minimized as much as possible any yearly in rent increases to 1% to 2% for our tenants. During that time, the city always increases the assessed value, which increases our insurance, and anyone who plays, pays them knows property taxes only ever increase and increase. I've had to replace or repair appliances, clear the sewer line, repair the heating system, replace the deck, and many other things. Having minimized rent increases puts me behind the eight ball regarding long-term major repairs, such as eventual roof replacement. replacement. Instead, I'm counting on long-term equity to make bearable those large impending expenses. I'm not some evil jerkwad taking advantage, but rather both easing life's burden on our renter's family and benefiting myself with equity appreciation. Considering that property taxes are 300 a month and always rising, home insurance and landlord liability insurance is 150 a month and always rising, and the mortgage is at $850 a month. That $1,300 a month is actually more than I currently charge. 
and the mortgage, and therefore the rent would be way more for some other landlord buying the house at today's assessed value. Look, don't cry for me, Argentina. But when you think of those evil long-term or short-term landlords, maybe consider the actual cost they incur before handing down judgment from a position of moral superiority. Thanks. Thank you. We have Brenda back. Brenda, hi. Welcome. Oh, we don't hear you. Are you? Jacoby. You're unmuted on our end, but we can't hear you. She goes to her microphone settings. And she goes up. Brenda, if you could go to your microphone settings on WebEx. Choose your computer as the audio input. Okay. Brenda, we're going to come back to you. We're going to do some more open forum, then we'll come back. <coughs> and next up is Peter. Hi, Peter. Welcome. You've got two minutes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Esteemed members of the council, I am a homeowner in East Central. I do want to say that there's something that really disturbs me, and it's the fact that an entity like Jewel's Helping Hands is being sold off as a humanitarian organization when all she is is a con artist. She has poisoned the area around East Central. We will never be the same. There are homeowners there that are truly traumatized, that are afraid to go out in public. We were completely occupied, and that's what it was. It wasn't anybody asked us. It was basically, well, what are they going to say? And before we knew it, there were 600 individuals there breaking the law with impunity. As a homeowner, I had to spend many hundreds of dollars to make up losses, and I just have to tell you that the energy that's left there because of it is a blight on this city, it's a blight on this county, and it's a blight on this community. There are going to be voices that are going to hold in judgment. I'm not one of those people. I believe in blessings. But I will tell you this, the energy that's left behind is toxic, and it needs to be addressed from the environmental, from the emotional and from everything else and if any of you have a soul you will help the people of east central or there will people or there will be people that will help us thank you for your time thank you peter next up is elizabeth and then after elizabeth is Shun sunshine and then rick Welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you. Good evening, council members. Um, my name is Elizabeth. I'm here to talk about the community fluoridation. Um, while I can sympathize with wanting to reduce cavities in our community, truly I do, the numerous downsides to community fluoridation far outweigh the benefits. I do not have time to give a full perspective on all the downsides to community fluoridation, so tonight I will be speaking on behalf of the Spokane River and its inhabitants. I love the Spokane River. I snorkel in it every summer, I swim in it every summer. Um, what community fluoridation in Spokane would entail is adding 1,435,000 pounds of liquid fluoride chemicals to our water every year. 1% of this water would get consumed. 99% would go into the ground or through the sewage uh, treatment and ultimately back into the river. The fluoride chemicals are tested by the NSF, which finds that 38% of the time, the fluoride chemicals contain lead or arsenic. This should not be put into our water. Community, um, community fluoridation is harmful to aquatic life. And I have here a print off directly from the Columbia River Keepers website who opposed um, fluoridating Portland. And they say, what we add to our drinking water, we add to our rivers and our salmon. Fluoride is a toxic pollutant that harms salmon and other aquatic life. 
This is what we know. Fluoride is harmful to salmon. Scientific studies concluded salmon and rainbow trout are harmed by fluoride concentrations below the concentration that, fluoride, that, that Portland would add to drinking water. Fluoride bioaccumulates in fish. Historically, fluoride chemicals discharged into the Columbia River from aluminum mills seriously impacted salmon migration. Columbia River Keeper encourages a no vote on fluoridation. And Elizabeth, then they quote the study. Time's up. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Next up, uh, Sunshine. Hi, Sunshine. Welcome. Got two minutes. Sunshine Wigan from yeah. Spokane. Um, I just wanted to kind of give a shout out to the Veterans Hospital. I love how when well, I'm doing outreach to I people or whatever, um, if someone's in a crisis, I can just go up there and there's always a social worker that can help me. Well, it was. And that's it. It's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> and um, they're always really kind and whatnot. And the food program there is really good too. And so I find that really neat because in a lot of places, people that have food allergies and stuff, um, they have a hard time eating the food in hospitals and things. And I think the program in that hospital is really good um, for accommodating some of those needs. So I just wanted to kind of give them a shout out uh, that they're doing a really good job. Thank you. Thank you, Sunshine. We're going to have Rick, and then we're going to try Brenda again. Greetings. I was thinking about all the punitive actions that are put towards people that are homeless, the criminalization of homelessness, you know, and, you know, people that come downtown get their parking tickets. And we still have these ugly little lime scooters running around on the sidewalks. And there's a law that says they're not supposed to do it. But it's never enforced. And I don't know why it's never enforced. See, because when people that are doing their parking, they'll get taken to court if they don't pay their bill. Well, anybody that gets on a lime scooter has to use a debit card or a credit card. So you got a paper trail. But yet... They won't go after the lime scooters at all. Yet they're still riding on the run of side, the, the, the sidewalks, and people have to duck and dodge from them. And yet you still want to punish people that are homeless, <clears throat> and yet you won't go after the people that are on the lime scooters that have all the money. So I, I, I have a hard time wrestling with this, you know. So I'm trying to see why isn't anything done about it. I don't know right. why isn't anything done Rick. about it, but, I, but I'm putting it out to you. Okay. It should be something done about it. They, and they took their little tags off. It's Rick. been two minutes already? Sorry, yes. Are you sure? I got uh, a timer. Yeah. It's, it's, it's off. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, Brenda, we're going to try you again. Can you see? Okay, can oh, you hear me? Lovely. Okay, go ahead. Well, thank you very much for your patience. Um, I'm honored to be here today, and the neighborhood of my poem, The Donut Man, is East Central, that is, the old ferry mill on East Sprague. The Donut Man. My daddy, he be a donut man. He works late at the flour mill, and when he comes home, he carries a big sack full of donuts. They're from the test kitchen left over at the end of the day. They don't have icing on them. They're plain, but taste like cake and look like little wheels. My mama, she said, good. We have dessert tonight. And I laugh because we're having a party. My daddy has so many donuts. He gives them to all our friends and I eat all day and more are still sitting on the kitchen table. When I grow up, I'll make my mama happy and give donuts to my friends. Every day a party with plenty for daddy because I'll be the donut man. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> okay. Meanwhile, back to open forum, and Council Member uh,
Wilkerson reminded me that I'm not asking for your, for your full name. So if you could introduce yourself when you come up, that would be helpful for Ms. Farnsworth as well. So um, next up is Dave M. Uh, is this person online? I believe so. Dave, are you online? Yeah, I can hit star three. Can you hit star three? He's unmuted. You're unmuted. Good evening, Council. Uh, it's good to be back. Um, I would ask the Council why fluoride. We voted, we decided. There's no reason it should be brought up for discussion at this point. The next thing is we have a very important election coming up and I hope that uh, I would ask everyone to please vote. Ballots should have been there. You should have your ballots and uh, please make sure you return them on time. Now, will I be uh, called on again for ordinance C36405? Yes. Okay. Um, that's it that I've got for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Terry Sullivan, Cindy Zapataki, and Will. Welcome. Could you give us your name? And Thank you. Good evening, council members. I'm Terrence Sullivan, Spokane resident, and I'm here to express my opposition to the fluoride initiative. I speak as a lifelong Spokane resident, and I stand with the majorities that voted three out of three in opposition to fluoridation. As the last speaker said, um, it's like the saying, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Well, I think we've tried and tried again, and I think the issue should be resolved by bearing it. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Terry. And Cindy? I'm Cindy Zapataki. I'm a resident of Spokane. Regarding the addition of toxic fluoride to all drinking water in Spokane, I come to urge you not to approve of this. We have been blessed by our Creator God with the cleanest water on earth. You have a huge stack of reports and studies submitted to you by Safe Water Spokane, attesting to the scientific reasons for not putting this byproduct of fertilizer into our water. We know that the newest science has pointed to special dangers to children from ingesting fluoride. We know it will leach down into our beautiful aquifer where most surface water ends up. It is just common sense to make cheap fluoride drops available to those who want them. It makes sense to give toothbrushes and toothpaste to be spit out to all school children yearly as part of a comprehensive good hygiene program. Tooth and gum disease will not be stopped by fluoride tablets. Less sugar and better nutrition will help overall health a lot. Bringing back home ec classes also is advisable so that kids can be taught what diet is most healthy and also how to prepare and cook their food so nutrients are not lost. It would also help our children to learn how to sew on a button or repair a torn seam so that the waste of clothing as well as food will not continue. There is no magic bullet for good health, but the education of our young is a really good place to start. Vote no on a universal fluoride addition to our pure, clean water. Thank you. Thank you. Will Hewings. After that is Steve Corker, and then Ted Harris, and Justin Holler. Uh, good evening. My name is Will Hewlings, the downtown Spokane. Um, I uh, didn't think I was going to be able to speak today, but uh, I just 
Just would like to comment on, this happened recently, according to Spokane News, but just right outside over there in the park, there's a 16-year-old girl that was detained by SPD and she had fought with law enforcement, pulled a weapon on them and she's, and she's now in jail. But today, riding around, you know, I live, this is my neighborhood, and I go to the park. It's pretty intimidating when there's a bunch of little, uh, sorry, I don't know what to call them, hoodlums. A bunch of young kids, obviously, they're out, you know, enjoying their summer. But it ends up, they start fighting. Next thing you know, they're stabbing each other, or they're pulling knives on people like me, and then I get trespassed from the park for a whole year, you know. And so what I'm saying is, you know, I, I remember growing up, maybe you can take some of this money that you put towards these rainbow sidewalks and all this other stuff, maybe come up with some programs for these kids, maybe uh, uh, somewhere where they can hang out in the park but it's not good for tourists. I, t I talked to people from Phoenix. They were commenting on this guy that was bent over looking like a zombie. And they seen me watching him because I wasn't sure if he was gonna do something to these people and they just said they were from Phoenix. So they said they see it all the time. But something needs to be done. So that's all I gotta say, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Steve Corker, welcome. You have two minutes. I'm Steve Corker from the city of Spokane. Um, I moved to Spokane in 1970. I had lived in eight cities that all had fluoridation in them. And when I came to Spokane, I made the basic inquiry, kind of begged the issue for a while until I had children. But over the last 50 years, I've watched this debate go on. I've watched three public votes go on. I was on the uh, health district, and for four years, the first 30 minutes of every meeting was basically people speaking against fluoride. Um, and so I don't want to really talk about whether I'm for or against fluoride. I'd like to talk about the process. The process of almost recognizing the public issue and concern. And over the last 50 years, I can't think of a single issue that has drawn more attention, caused more public testimony than fluoride, and has basically been people saying, I'm against it. And I think that it's critically important that you get not only the input, but I think it requires another public vote. I think that is something that is a part of our accountability to our public when major issues come up and there's major divisions, especially in an issue like this. I think the decision should be left up to the public. And I've often heard a lot of people talk about, I don't want government getting involved in forcing choices in my medical care. And that with all the controversies going today on government's involvement in dictating how we manage our bodies, I think public process demands that if this is going to be brought to the public again, it should have the vote and support of the people of Spokane. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Ted Harris means, and then after that, Justin Holler. Hi, I'm Ted Harris means. I'm from Northeast Spokane. I've come to let the city council know just how badly Scraps is failing at its job. I have been in contact with Representative Cathcart. Um, about an issue that happened to me and my neighbors last week where we had to work with each other to care for two lost dogs that were roaming our neighborhood. We tried to contact Scraps. One of my neighbors tried taking the dogs to Scraps and every time we spoke with them, save for a time outside of normal business hours, they refused to take the dogs claiming to be full. Animal control with a full shelter is like a fire department without water. It can't do its job. I don't know what is causing this problem, but the reality is that with close to a quarter, three quarters of a million dollars 
annually given to scraps from this city, something needs to be done. Uh, I would hope that uh, Councilman Cathcart's look into the information about it will yield some of those results, but it needs to be taken care of quickly. This is, it seems that the shelter has been full likely for a couple of months. Anyway, thank, thank you. Thank you. Justin Holler. Yeah, I'm Justin Haller, and I left District uh, 2 because the city council members were ineffective there. You were one of them, Lori Kinnear. Beggs was the other one, and uh, good riddance to one of you, and soon to be good riddance to the other. Um, I don't want fluoride in the water either. I don't think anyone does. No one in the right mind would. Uh, Lori Kinnear, do you think it's okay to lurch towards somebody when you confront them about possible ethics violations with Planned Parenthood, is that okay with you? If, it, if, if I were to lurch forward towards you and put my finger in my face, you'd call security, wouldn't you? I bet you would. Maybe that's why you guys didn't air February 9th episode. Look that up. Didn't air it. Anyway, as far as uh, Bravo Whiskey, did you pay your property taxes? I know I can't mention anyone by name, but it sure would be nice for someone who's running for city council president to pay, to pay their property taxes and to start feeling comfortable helping law enforcement. That would be great because you guys get the paycheck from the same people, the taxpayers. Um, once again, by what metric do you solve the homeless problem? By what dollar per person uh, ratio do you guys solve anything? I don't see a metric. I don't see a, a hardened dollar amount per person saved and helped off the street. There's, there's no metric, it's just a bottomless pit. Um, the other thing is, uh, there's possible switchbacks being built uh, for um, the Monroe Street, just before the Monroe, Mer but yeah, that, that's all folks, the Monroe Street Bridge. Who uses that? I went there for an hour and I didn't see all but two people. And I, I, I asked one of them, do you want switchbacks? And they go, well, why would I need switchbacks? We have staircase. So. Having switchbacks for, for homeless people to park their shopping carts is a waste of money. I just, I don't see it. And, and once again, what do you do with the money you already steal? There's in, in, uh, gross inefficiencies in, in the federal government, in the state government, in the local government. It's really hard to see. Thank you. Right. Uh, let's move on to our consent agenda. Go ahead and read it. Reports, contracts, and claims. One purchase from DNL Supply Company Inc. Moses Lake, Washington, of sewer and stormwater access frames and covers for the wastewater management department, ninety-five thousand three hundred seventy-five dollars plus tax. Two value blankets with special asphalt products Inc. Spokane, utilizing Washington State Contract Number zero seven one two one for purchases for the street department of A. Nouveau Gap, eighty thousand dollars. B, SA Premier, Crack Sealant, $125,000. Three, public works agreement with Aero Concrete and Asphalt Specialties, Spokane, for emergency sinkhole repair in the Spokane Police Department, Northeast Precinct par parking lot from May 5th, 2023 to May 31st, 2023, <clears throat> $57,625.24, including tax. Four, acceptance of grant funding from the Washington Association of Sheriffs and police chiefs for the Washington Auto Theft Prevention Program to be used to fund one police detective position to focus on auto theft enforcement and prevention from July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2025, $294,191. Five, two-year contract with Applied Industrial Technologies, Spokane, for the as-needed purchase and installation of conveyor belts at the waste to energy facility from July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2025, not to exceed $210,000 plus tax. Six, report of the mayor of pending A, claims and payments of previously approved obligations, including those of Parks and Library through July 7th, 2023, total $7,071,291.38, with Parks and Library claims approved by their respective boards. Warrants excluding Parks and Library total $6,556,018.27. B, payroll claims of previously approved obligations through July 8, 2023, $9,471,300.64. Thank you. We have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have one person signed up for uh, comment, and that's uh, Dennis Flynn. 
Welcome. You have three minutes. Thank you. I won't take near that. Dennis Flynn, living near St. Charles. Uh, this is regarding 0685, the uh, Washington State uh, Sheriff's and the vehicle, stolen vehicles. Uh, resources and choices. We must ensure our highly paid public servants are working as hard as those of us in the nonprofit and private sectors to stretch our dollars for maximum impact. Your direction to our departments must include follow-up to ensure accountability and transparency are meeting the needs of our citizens. Will metrics of performance be kept and made public, such as year-over-year -year comparison of solved vehicle thefts or increases slash decreases in comparison to other communities who did receive uh, grant funding uh, but chose a different path or did not receive grant funding? These types of comparisons would be necessary to determine if our community would benefit from then funding a dedicated position to continue after the grant completes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any comments from council? Really? Okay. All those in favor accepting the advent or the uh, consent agenda? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. It passes. Thank you. Miss. Um, Farnsworth, do you want to go on to uh, resolution 2023-0060, please? Resolution 2023-060, appointing Lori Kinnear to fill the position of Spokane City Council President, vacated by Brian Beggs. Okay, we have three people signed up. Uh, first is Dennis Flynn. Thank you, Council. Dennis Flynn, live near St. Charles. I've been coming here consistently for a couple months now uh, to try to give a different perspective than maybe you otherwise hear, but maybe you hear my perspective from other constituents as well. I hear claims of desiring collaboration to come to compromise. However, I've noticed when it's not a 7-0 vote for all the obvious things like the consent agenda, the next most common result is 5-2 with those who are considered by many, maybe not by themselves, but by many, liberal, progressive, and on the left, those five versus two are considered conservative and on the right. I have seen the rare 6-1 and the even rarer 4-3 vote. And if memory serves me correctly, those have been from Bingle, Cathcart, and Kinnear who have crossed the line to the other side. So I'd propose if you are committed to the compromise position you claim that you consider Bingle, Cathcart, or Kinnear to fill the vote of, a, of the president until an election is held, and so I'm pleased with this choice. Thank you. Will Hewlings. Will Hewlings. Going once. Right. I will come back. Uh, Catherine Corrick. Good evening, Councilperson Kinnear, Cotem, okay, and the rest of the council. My name is Catherine Corrick. I live in the East Central District. I'm a community volunteer um, and an advocate for persons experiencing homelessness. And I would like to take note that in the two years that I've been coming here on a regular basis, that I have particularly noticed that Council person Kinnear um, has been um, a calm influence on the city council um, and is a good um, collaborator. And whether you be left, right, green, or purple, she is a good listener and tries to get people together. So I would like to encourage you all to get together to support her so that during this turbulent time of this election period, this divisive time, we can have a council that is of one voice, at least a civil and um, a civil voice and a communicative voice. Thank you. Thank you. Will Hewings.
Good evening again. My name is William Hewlings. I live downtown Spokane. Spokane. Um, I didn't realize I was going to be able to speak about this. But um, uh, hopefully whoever you choose as city council president follows the city's ethics policy that you guys passed in 2015. Um, because I mean, just since I've been coming to city council, I mean, the prior city council president, Brianne Beggs, was actively trying to help or help. There's emails, okay? You guys are big about emails. I got the emails. Kinnear, Burke, so you guys are helping some social justice activists, they come up here and would speak about all kinds of stuff, but they were also the ones that took me to court and I spoke about this. So you, you guys say I'm dangerous. I mean, you, you guys still have them rumors floating around, but I don't appreciate it. And just because Brianne's gone, I'm, <laughs> you guys just wait, because that's my concern. I mean, corruption. I mean, people getting other people, people's families, getting them onto city council, getting paid $107,000 a year while, you know, our, we, we can't hire police, we can't hire this. You got a social justice activist that's now manager of homeless services or whatever. I haven't forgot. And I know they watch this, so I hope they just remember. But anyways, thank you. Thank you. All right. Council commentary. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, I think you, would, you, you will do a very good job in this role, and I'm excited to support you in that. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you uh, the last three and a half years, and I would just say that the thing about this that, that's disappointing is that you'll be leaving a month early. And uh, I don't know if folks realize that, that by moving into this position that that would be the result, but I, uh, I wish that wasn't so. So I just wanted to share that. I just want to say that I support this. I think that we have all worked really well together. It's nice to see that um, we're moving forward and you're willing to do this job because sometimes it's a little thankless. But um, I'm pleased to support you and I thank you for your leadership. And um, hopefully the community will see as we take these votes tonight that we may differ politically, but we really try hard to work together. and. Um, and I can honestly say that we care about what's going on in our neighborhoods with our constituents more than we care about the politics that, that rings in our ears, um, rings in everybody's ears right now. So this is a new start and I'm happy to support you and congratulations. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, I certainly support you, but it's bittersweet for me because I lose my seat mate from District 2 to council president, and so I'll be getting a new seat mate, but I know we'll still be working together for the good of District 2, but really for the good of all of Spokane. So I'm excited, and you can still come have tea with me, even though you're council president. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll just say thank you, council president Kinnear, or soon to be, uh, for volunteering as tribute and taking one for the team from council to have all d comments directed towards you and not in us anymore. So <laughs> you volunteered for that, so we appreciate that. But uh, in seriousness, definitely excited to work with you in this role and know you that you'll do a great job, so thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Okay, oh, okay, go ahead. Well, I feel obligated. Everybody else said <laughs> something nice. <laughs> I have enjoyed working with you for about a year. And a half. No, I mean, no, I'm just playing. <laughs> it's really been great. I think you're going to do a very good job. You're the most logical choice for this, and um, I think you will do a good job. I appreciate you starting meetings on time and keeping us on task, and I think it's going to be better for us, that structure. I think you're going to do a good job, so great. thank you. Thank yeah. you. And I'll just mention, somebody said we should have an election to do this. Indeed, we are. Mm -hmm. We're in the midst of an election right now. So I uh, will serve until November 28th. The people... There'll be two people who will be elected that will take over at that point. One is a council president, and the other one would be the person we choose to fill my District 2 seat. So 
there is an election. <laughs> it's coming. And until that time, I am really honored to serve all of you. I love working with all of you. And we're going to get some stuff done. And we're going to continue to represent our constituents in the best way we can. And my door's always open. So to staff and to people in the, in the city, don't forget that part. So prepare to vote. That's a 6-0. Mark it on your calendar. Okay. Council President? Yes. Will I still be able to tell my jokes? Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up is 0061. Do you want to go ahead and read that? Resolution 2023-0061, amending the appointments of council members to boards and commissions. Okay, we have one, two, three, four. People signed uh, up. Nobody actually signed up for that. That's an ordinance. All right. Okay. Any comments? Go ahead. Can I comment on this? Yes, please. So um, just so people know, if you haven't looked in the package um, the, that goes with the materials that go with the agenda, um, we've had to rearrange some of our boards and commission appointments um, because we've lost one member. So that's what this is all about. But the highlight, I think, for me is that we also have to, um, we are also voting on the council president pro tem position, um, and that's all included in that package. And I am just very happy that um, we have talked and council president or council member Cathcart um, is on that list to be council president pro tem, which means he'll work right under council president. And again, I think that's, um, I think I've, I've, we've had lots of discussions. It's a lot of work. No matter what you do on council, it's a lot of work, but particularly those two positions can get quite, um, quite busy. And so I'm thrilled that um, he is on our list and hopefully this will be a unanimous vote. And again, um, one more opportunity to say that um, we're working well together and um, I'm very proud of this moment that we're up here and making some changes and it feels good. So thank you. Anyone else? Go ahead. I too want to congratulate uh, Mr. Cathcart on um, uh, the position he's about to step in and I think it really does. I think you said something there that was that is really genuine that um, by um, by us agreeing to have uh, Council Member Cathcart in that position, that it does show a uh, willingness for us to work together and find something that is a, a community solution, uh, which I know that um, uh, many in the community have not always felt as if that was the, the position, but I think that uh, with, with the six that we have here, I think that is um, our position, and I look forward to uh, the next five months? Five and a half. Five and a half. Give or take. Yeah. yeah give or take, of us uh, working together. Um, I will say today has actually already been a lot of fun with this group, and so appreciate you all. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I would just want to educate the audience for a bit. There are dozens of boards and commissions that we are required to serve on. So for the folks that think this is our only meeting, these Mondays are only meeting au contraire, so each of us serve on about 13 outside boards and commissions. So you start adding up that time. It's a lot of time. And each of those committee assignments also have subcommittees we serve on. So you may think, oh, you're just on STA. No, you're on STA and you've got a committee that you serve on. So it's a lot of time. It's a lot of work. And I commend all of you who are very devoted to the things that you are serving on now and serving our community. We represent the city of Spokane on all these boards and commissions and vote accordingly. So want to make sure people understand that. If you're running for office and you think you're just going to sit up here on Monday night, be prepared because you've got a lot of work ahead of you. So, all right, prepare to vote. Great. Thank you. All right. Unanimous and next, please. Ordinance 
Ordinance C-3645 concerning parking regulations for housing, exempting minimum parking space requirements for certain residential developments, adopting a new Chapter 17C.405 of the Spokane Municipal Code, interim parking regulations for housing, setting a public hearing, and establishing a work program. Thank you. We have, now we have four people signed up. So first up is Dennis Flynn. You have three minutes. Thank you, Dennis Flynn, live near St. Charles. Uh, regarding, let me get a map up here. Regarding limiting the parking uh, within half a mile of public transit stops, um, I believe modifying the text of an ordinance should start over to first reading, in my opinion, by the way. Uh, this half mile distance seems to me to be ridiculous because what it really means is a half mile radius, which is a one mile diameter. Um, so what percentage of the city is covered by this? 70, 80, 90% more? Just look at the STA map, put a one mile circle around each of those lines, and that's how much of the city will not have any off street parking requirement. It would be more fair, not to mention honest, to simply eliminate any off street parking requirement everywhere. But do we know how impactful is on-street parking to current street cleaning and snow removal operations? Will this make it worse? How many complaints currently come in regarding on-street parking? Will that become worse? I feel this is short-sighted and will negatively impact public safety, snow removal, street cleaning. And, and when we look at what the city staff enter in the how will data be collected regarding the effectiveness, there's a generic statement saying data will be collected. I'm not sure what sort of transparent follow-up and report out will be made and pushed out to the citizens. Um, in accordance with your stated desire for collaboration and compromise, I would implore you to modify subsection C, expiration, to read a unanimous council vote as required to extend the section, otherwise the section shall expire on July 9th, 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Rick Bocook. You need to speak louder, Lori. People can't hear you. <clears throat> anyway, um, about this parking thing, I'm a bus rider, and uh, but at the same time, I say, if you're going to do this kind of stuff, don't put any more parking meters in. It's bad enough that you put parking meters in residential neighborhoods as it is, and are you trying to get rid of the drivers? Is that what you're trying to do? And, uh, and if you think that the bus system is good for employment, you're wrong because Spokane is 20 years, 30 years behind, not a 24 hour city. Um, Sunday, you're, if you're stuck in an area, you can't catch a bus at all. Three or four miles away from your home, you have to be, you're walking or you have to get a whatever. But uh, I just, just don't put no parking meters in there. I mean, it's bad enough that, that people are overtaxed as it is and I think you, and as far as parking goes I think you should go back to the six o'clock thing instead of the seven o'clock thing and get rid of the that little bill that you got with River Park Square thank you thank you uh, Dave M online press star three you're unmuted go ahead excuse me uh, good evening, Council. Uh, congratulations, uh, Ms. Kinnear. Thank you. And the rest of the Council members. Uh, it seems there's a little bit lighter, lighter mood to the Council this week. Uh, regarding Ordinance C-36405, I'm not necessarily for or against this. Um, my questions would be, or concerns would be, will we have residents where there's, you know, at a four bedroom house, two bedroom house, will we have 20 vehicles parked in front of that house? Is it, you know, unlimited? I didn't see anything in the proposal or in the ordinance that, you know, sets a number of cars to an area. I do see that it expires on July 9th, 2024, and I'm hoping that the information collected 
will be transparent and any issues that develop can be uh, addressed. That's about all I have to say on this issue, but uh, remember, we've got an election, so everybody vote, please. Thanks, Council. Thank have you. a good evening. Thank you. Uh, next up is Michelle Pappas. Welcome. You have three minutes. Hello, council members, and thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Michelle Pappas. I am the Spokane Program Manager for FutureWise, as well as a Spokane resident. I want to thank you all for reviewing this pilot program that I and my organization are proud to support. Requiring parking spots drives up the costs of building new housing, especially affordable housing. Spokane is in a housing shortage and we need to make it easier, not harder, to build more housing. This opportunity gives developers a choice to build parking that costs twenty to forty thousand dollars or to build within a half a mile of transit where cars are less needed. Additionally, at this time, it is illegal for landlords to charge renters less if they don't have a car. This ordinance is an opportunity for ending that unjust fee. Washington is the only state on the West Coast to still have parking minimum requirements, and it is time Spokane lead the charge for the rest of the state to follow. We look forward to this ordinance being joined with other programs that create affordability standards, proactive rental assistance, and increased transit. I am grateful for you all leading the way in Washington State. Thank you. Thank you. Council commentary. Everybody's pointing. Who are we? Are I you guess first? I'll start. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, I uh, thank you everyone for coming and testifying and support. I'm really proud to be co-sponsoring this with Council Member Bingle um, and having the support from lots of community partners and organizations who talked about this, including FutureWise, the Spokane Realtors Association, Spokane Low Income Housing Coalition, the Spokane Home Builders, the Lands Council, and uh, 350 Spokane have all written in support. Um, not all of them can make it, it's summer, but they have let us know that they support it. Uh, I think it's really important to be super crystal clear about this ordinance. It's about reducing barriers to affordable housing and cutting housing costs. Uh, as was mentioned, street parking or off street parking can add substantial costs to the housing development and creation of new housing, 20 to $45,000 per unit. Uh, and even more if it's underground parking for apartment complexes. It's also important to know that the second part of this is about allowing landlords to charge less for rent. Uh, studies have shown that it can increase rent by about 17%, which comes out to about $3,000 a year just for parking. So if you don't have a car, you have to pay for the parking even if you don't use it. So this is about addressing the housing crisis that we're in and providing another tool to address housing affordability. It's also really important to note that, and be super crystal clear, this does not stop parking from being built. It just simply says that you do not have to build the parking if you do not want to. Uh, so parking will still be built in Spokane, and it has been built in Spokane. Uh, downtown Spokane has had no parking minimum requirements for new construction for the last few years, and new buildings have been built, uh, such as the Warren Apartments. And um, I think it's about 50 to 70% of their units have parking built, even though they're not required to. So parking will still be built. It just says that it, it's available to not have parking if you don't need it. Uh, there are concerns, and, there, and I understand those concerns uh, for people that have limited ability and physical mobility about trying to park blocks away from their house or too far for, for public transit. It's also important to consider that this ordinance does not eliminate existing parking. So all the apartments, all of the houses that already have parking continue to have parking. So there's lots of opportunity. This is only a one-year pilot. Over the next year, we'll have uh, continued outreach. We'll have more public hearings here, uh, and we'll hear what, what the needs are. And we'll talk about how to address those concerns around snow removal and other issues. Um, it's also important to know that this ordinance or this type of ordinance has been uh, passed across the country, cities such as Anchorage, Alaska, uh, San Jose, California, Raleigh, North Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee, Richmond, Virginia, and Bend, Oregon have all passed this in just the last year. 
Uh, and as far as I know, Anchorage, Alaska has a lot more snow than we do. And so if they're able to figure it out, I think we can too. So really proud to be supporting this and addressing housing affordability here in Spokane and proving our environmental impacts by encouraging more use of transit. And I think this goes with more investment in transit, which as board members, we continue to advocate for here too. And um, I, I'm excited about the opportunity that this has for, for our community. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I guess first I want to thank Zach for, for bringing this forward. I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a pretty big step and, and, um, uh, and it's something that certainly we have to be talking about. I think I'm going to ruin our una unanimity here. Um, I, I'm not going to quite get there to vote for yes on this tonight. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons why. First and foremost, we have an ongoing transit-oriented development study in my district right now. And out of respect for that process, I want to wait until that's concluded before we take some big steps that will affect uh, some of those areas. Related to that, we have had an ongoing severe issue with parking that has not yet been addressed around the Gonzaga University Logan areas. And we don't have anything contemplated in this as to how we might address those parking issues that already exist let alone new ones that could occur as a result. Um, and so that's something that I, I would like to get some additional um, study on. And then the last part, I, I, I am concerned about unintended consequences related to landlord-tenant law. Uh, I, see, I see opportunity here for, unfortunately, some folks who might be unscrupulous to use this as a way to really increase the cost of, of living, not necessarily housing, but the cost of living. And, and I really worry about the impacts of that across the community. Now, I think all of this can be uh, and will be sorted out, but we're not there yet. And the number of unintended consequences that I see affecting my district and, and uh, particularly the Logan neighborhood and the areas around the university district, I just think are so big um, that I just think it needs more study. Uh, I had asked to, to send this to plan commission to get their views. That didn't happen, but, um, but I, I will look forward to the results. I, I believe there are probably uh, five votes for this tonight, and so I will look forward to the results um, <coughs> as they come. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Anyone else? Go ahead. Um, yeah, I hear everybody's concerns on this, and every single one of them is valid. Uh, you know, we have spoken with Marlene Feist on snow removal, street cleaning, those kinds of, of issues, because they are real issues, and there are certain neighborhoods that have real issues with that, Brown's Edition being one of them, uh, where we have real issues with snow removal and street cleaning. And so when you, um, when you bring that up, you are not wrong. Uh, we have um, had those discussions. Um, on whether or not it should have been citywide, I think um, Council Member Zappone and I, we had discussed taking it citywide because again, I, I dislike um, uh, these decisions that you know, allow for some of it here, but not everywhere, because I think it does affect uh, the livability of certain areas or the value of land or those kinds of things. And so I prefer all the rules to be similar throughout the entire city. However, um, what we were modeling this after was a state law that was passed. And so for us to be in compliance with that, we, we kept it uh, within transit. Um, and uh, so that's why it didn't go uh, citywide. Um, when it comes to um, issues like this, there, there are real downsides. But I think there's real upsides because one of the things that we continue to see is the crunch on housing and the, the cost of rent and the cost of purchasing homes and those kinds of things. And I think every little thing that we can do, every little step forward on, on making housing more affordable, not just for people renting, not just for the lowest um, income, um, although it is going to help tremendously there, also people wanting to step out of renting into home ownership, this is also gonna, um, going to help there. And so I think that it has the real potential for, <clears throat> for great good as well, which is one of the reasons why as we talk through this, the one year pilot program, we will be compiling data on uh, where are these homes being built. Uh, currently there are no parking minimums downtown. And so we're extending that uh, to be more of the city. And downtown we've seen projects got getting built because uh, they didn't have parking minimums that previously wouldn't have been able uh, to have been built. Um, and uh, Council Member Sapone, you cited stats from other cities that they've seen 400% increase um, in housing um, production 
that uh, after these were passed, you know, 60 to 70 percent of the um, of the units that got built would have been previously illegal, and this opened the door to these units being coming onto the market, which is something we desperately need in this city. So I acknowledge the real downsides, um, but I, I think that this is going to be far better than it is worse. Um, and any of the issues that come up with it, I know that we will address. Or in the end, if it just really tanks uh, after a year and it's no good, it's, it is a pilot program and we can always uh, not extend it. But, uh, but I'm at least willing to try. I think that this has has great opportunity for the city of Spokane. So I was happy to co-sponsor this and work on this with council members opponent. and I appreciate your work on it. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh wait, go ahead. I'll go just comment, I support it because it's a pilot, but also in our local newspaper, there is a decline in people who are driving cars. And so in this year, some of the things, the concerns, if we will see the full impact of that in a year, probably not, but we'll keep our eye on it. But as we look at public transportation and a decline in drivers, where does the two connect? So we have to make it possible as we look at clean energy and as we go forward in our environment. I think it is a positive step forward. And again, as council uh, member Bingle said, if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. And we just have to be bold enough to say, we tried it and it didn't work. And it goes back to the way it was. Did you have something else? I go after Council Member Okay, Scott. go ahead. So I've struggled with this, and Zach and I have had quite a few conversations. Um, I'm going to go ahead and support it. Um, my big concern has been um, what happens with senior housing, senior citizens, and disabled. Um, and Council Member Zappone um, has assured me that those are issues that will be part of the discussion. Um, there are options, possible opportunities um, if we run into that type of an issue. But that's been my big concern with this is if you have a senior cottage area and um, there's no parking, seniors like to drive their cars. So um, I'm going to be watching this. I won't be here next year when it's time to take a look at it. But um, I will leave it in your hands and know that you will watch out for my seniors and anybody that uh, might need just a little help by driving a car and not taking a bus. Uh, we'll, look, we'll look forward to you, do you coming down and testifying. Because <laughs> yeah. I will be one of those seniors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Council members of Pound, did yeah. you have something to add? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll just re address a couple of the concerns again. Um, it, Planning Commission did not weigh on this formally, but uh, we're doing a process very similar to BOCA which is a one-year pilot program. Uh, we did talk to the Planning Commission for immediate feedback, and they raised no red flags and major concerns, and they were supportive of this approach. So uh, I, I think this is a positive path forward for this. And um, I think it's crucial to point out that similar to Boca, within one year, we're not seeing dramatic changes across the city. Your, your neighborhood's not going to dramatically change overnight. This is one year, it'll show us how many units are getting built with this type of parking. How can we project and plan going forward? Um, so this is a, a step in the right direction. And then we can address those future concerns and figure out ways to address snow removal and accessibility and stuff. That's what we have the next year to do. So really excited um, about the potential for that. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, prepare to vote. Good, thank you. Ordinance 5-1. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Ordinance C-36407, concerning the use of automated traffic safety cameras, extending the termination date for authorization to use automated traffic safety cameras, expanding the use of said cameras to school walk areas, public park speed zones, and hospital speed zones, and amending section 16A.64.220 and 16A.64.260 of the Spokane Municipal Code. Thank you. We have two people signed up to speak. Dennis Flynn. Thank you. Dennis Flynn, live near St. Charles. Regarding the traffic safety cameras, I already know that this will pass as we discussed it at the last meeting. Um, 
as appears all too often the case with these ordinances written up by people whose paychecks come from the blood, sweat, and tears of our tax dollars. When you look at the how will data be collected, in this one it's blank. In other cases, many times it's N slash A, or as we talked about earlier, data will be collected. So hopefully you've demanded and been provided comparison data with the current cameras uh, regarding traffic and pedestrian safety, but it hasn't been shared in this chamber that I've seen. When you impose your will without providing us some stub substantive evidence so that we can judge for ourselves the veracity of your decision, you do a disservice to us citizens and you blemish the public image of the council. Thank you. Thank you. Rick Bocook. I don't have much to say about this. I just want to make... Is it, I want to just put a question out. Is the traffic safety cameras, is it local? Is it Spokane or is it some other state? Some other state, okay. So I think that I think that's one of the issues about this stuff is that everything, we should bring it back to this city. It should not be in another state, you know. States have different, they have different laws anyway, but it's just, it's just so wrong, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Council commentary. <clears throat> Go ahead. I would just like to say to anybody in the state of Washington, I think there's a real business opportunity for you <laughs> if you uh, got into it. But uh, other than that, I, um, I support this. I'm not a huge fan of traffic cameras uh, personally, um, but uh, I, um, there's one particular area of my district where uh, traffic is incredibly bad. It's incredibly dangerous for both the citizens. Uh, in a, in a high-use pedestrian area, uh, there are um, senior citizen homes along this, along this road, and uh, we've been having them do traffic specials out there because um, traffic is so bad. And what we're finding is that you know, of the uh, uh, of the dozens of people that are getting pulled over and getting traffic tickets, um, about half of them are going over 30 miles plus over the speed limit in this area, which is a uh, a real disaster and a real danger for that area. And so, what I'm hoping is that um, with this added element of uh, of scrutiny, since we uh, do not have um, the officers who are able to work the traffic unit, I hope that this makes um, a couple areas in my district a little bit safer for the for the residents. And um, again, uh, we will be uh, getting data on these from those companies. And uh, as that data comes in, we'll be able to understand if it is if it is working. If not, I'm happy to vote against this the next time. So, uh, but I am willing to uh, to support it today. Anyone else? Go ahead. I support this because it is public safety. If it saves one life, that will be enough for me. And a reminder, if the person is not speeding, they won't get a ticket, so there won't be any cost to the citizens. But it is an awareness, and we do not have the human capital uh, from the police department to do traffic controls like we have in the past. That would be great to have a car sitting there at some of those intersections, but that's not an option for us right now. Down the road, it might be. So this is the best we have to increase public safety, increase some revenues if you're breaking the law that can be re-diverted to traffic calming measures in our community. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, prepare to vote. Thank you all. Now we're going to pivot to our town hall with our neighborhoods. This is exciting. Neighborhoods are going to give us presentations on all the good work they've been doing. And uh, we're 10 minutes each. And Jacoby's going to time you. So he'll give you the one minute warning. Please allow some time for questions. So try not to fill up your whole 10 minutes with PowerPoint to give us some time to ask questions about your neighborhood and what's going on. So I'm going to look to Patrick Stryker, our ONS director, to introduce and talk a little bit about what we're going to hear tonight. 
Thank you. Welcome. All right. Good evening, council members. Uh, thanks for having us out tonight. Um, I've been the director of the Office of Neighborhood Services for six months now, almost to the day. Uh, and it's going great. We got a lot of great things that we're doing. And so Patrick, I, you can raise that. I know. Where's the, oh, is this yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. You're probably the tallest person in the room. Magic. But yeah, there we there go. We go. Thank is that you. better? All yes. right, thank you. And maybe now I can see this. Uh, the last six months, we've got a lot of things going on at ONS that we're working on. Um, we've changed our schedules at work for the liaisons to be um, far more in attendance at the neighborhood councils to try and have greater presence and help the neighborhood councils grow. I've been trying to really connect more with the uh, neighborhood council leaders. Um, again, assess needs, help them grow. I've been working with Jessica Fisher to promote the neighborhood council meetings. We've got our monthly ONS meetings to really promote the neighborhood councils and get people going. Uh, Leitaw Hangman just came online. So now for the first time since pre-COVID, all 29 neighborhood councils are online, which is great. Some of them are struggling a little bit, but at least everybody is meeting and hey, we'll take that. Uh, special events, we're redoing how we do that. That falls under ONS and that's a bit um, clunky both for uh, the users in the community as well as on the backside, a lot of duplication of efforts. Um, and so we're completely redoing how that works. We just had a big meeting with the Parks Department today to start combining resources there in the hopes that um, we can make it easier for everybody and start getting even more of these special events that we see. Um, our disposal passes this spring had the highest redemption rate ever, uh, which is great. It caused us to end the program early, which is kind of the downside, but it was great to see how many people were using them. Um, 27 of the neighborhoods have set up cleanup events this year, um, which is significantly higher than in the past. Uh, traffic calming, we know that's a huge undertaking this year, but we've been happy to partner with city council and work with Abby Martin um, to help make that happen and get that um, feedback from people so we can determine priorities. Uh, 25 of the neighborhood councils applied for community engagement grants this year, which is a good strong number. Um, so you'll be seeing, as you already are, the concerts in the parks, the block parties, movie nights, um, and all those things that make Spokane so much fun. Um, SNLA, which is our Leadership Academy in partnership with Gonzaga, that graduated 16 new leaders this cohort. Um, and on that note, this fall coming up, we're doing a one-day summit to um, create more neighborhood leaders. Going to have a ton of classes that will be put on by ONS in partnership with uh, Building Stronger Neighborhoods. So a lot of good stuff going on, but uh, I know you guys want to hear from the neighborhoods. Uh, and I'm really excited because our neighborhoods are doing such great things. And I think you're going to hear um, a lot tonight. I'll call up uh, Polly Ann Burge, who is our new manager that we hired about two months ago. We stole her from code enforcement. Their loss, our gain. Uh, but she's going to introduce the first neighborhood council. And now you're going to have to yeah, lower the... Down, no, no. Which one is it, friend? Oh, this one here. Yeah. Thank you. There you go. Okay. And then just move the microphone to where it's your level. Gotcha. There you Thanks. go. Yeah, and Patrick's the only one that can kind of look over the partitions, and you can see him, his head over there, like, hey, I know, who's that? Um, hi there, Polly Ann Bird, she, her pronouns, and I'm here to introduce uh, Jeff Stevens, who is the cleanup coordinator for Audubon Downriver, as well as being a presenter at, um, uh, Patrick had mentioned, our uh, most recent Leadership Academy. So please, um, Jeff Stevens, come to the mic. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Council President, members of Council. Thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. My name is Jeff Stevens. I'm with the Audubon Downriver Neighborhood Council. And I'd like to begin uh, tonight by um, recognizing uh, our leadership team at this time. If I can get the first slide, please. And Jeff, you can just hit the keyboard oh, there to advance your slides. Awesome, thank you. Yep. Um, currently, we, Fran uh, Poppenler is our chair. Andrea is our secretary. Victor is our treasurer. We have four active committees right now dealing with traffic, membership and marketing, social media, and parks and open spaces, which is what I'm currently the chair of. We've got some exciting things happening in our neighborhood um, this year. First one I wanted to talk about is a new community garden that we're putting in in uh, Shadle, uh, near Shadle School. This was a vacant city parcel that was a result of a traffic calming project that happened several years ago. And it's basically looked like this the last several years. Uh, lots of weeds. Some of the neighbors have been good about taking care of it. We approached the city uh, a couple years ago about taking responsibility for this uh, section and turning it into a community garden. Took a while to get through all the loopholes to get that done, but we started uh, clearing it in fall of uh, last year. 
uh, with volunteers from Growing Neighbors and the neighborhood uh, and uh, cleared the site with the help of the WaterWise program. We put in four water spigots and cleared all the weeds and put in a layer of bark and let it set for the winter so that the weeds would all go away. In the spring, we started planning. And one of the things we wanted to do with this garden was to involve as many members of the community as possible. We approached neighborhood schools, uh, nonprofit organizations, the Master's Gardeners Program, Growing Neighbors, and a number of different groups. Uh, this is a particular planning day we had with the students from uh, Salish School who helped us plan in uh, the spring. Those raised beds that you see were done by the word working class in Shadle High School. They're built from resp repurposed um, pallets. Uh, we have this set in. We're hoping to put in a whole other set next year when school resumes also. Um, but the garden is going well. Um, it's still in the process, and I hope to come up and uh, uh, a, you know, give you an update on it next year. There's still a lot of work to be done there, but it looks a lot better than it looked before. And just to recognize some of the folks, again, Matt Growing Neighbors, Master Gardeners of the Schools, um, River Ridge Hardware for their materials, Judy's, uh, Chanted Garden, the Water Eyes people, and Kirsten, Mary, and Gail were really the leaders in this project, so we really appreciate their help. We also have some exciting pedestrian safety improvements coming to our uh, neighborhood. The first one is the Alberta Cochrane Disco Sidewalk Project, which is a huge project. It's connecting sidewalks all the way along three major arterials in our, um, in our neighborhood. Most of these are in the Finch Elementary School and the um, Audubon Park area, which has a lot of pedestrian traffic. The other component of that is to improve the, the pedestrian crossing at Milton Street and Northwest Boulevard. This is a safe route to school uh, that is typically staffed by crossing guards. They'll now have a pedestrian island in the center and an RFB uh, light also to stop traffic. Sadly, ne or sorely needed because the crossing guards have often, often talked about the danger of this intersection for, for students, so this would be a great upgrade. Um, Northwest Boulevard has been a challenge in our neighborhood as far as separating the city. It's a very busy arterial. So one of the things that we've been talking to the city about is more pedestrian crossings. And these are crossings that actually have the safety islands to make them more, uh, more safe. So in addition to the installation of the, or the upgrade to the one at Milton, we currently have the one at Audubon. We'll get two new ones north, uh, north uh, further north that will give access from the neighborhood onto the bluff and onto the trails that go down into uh, Riverside State Park. Um, that's a really important place to have it. Traffic there has nothing to stop it. There's no cross intersections or anything. So once you get on that section, traffic is moving fast. So we're looking forward to improving the pedestrian access along that, uh, along that area. And we really appreciate the city's uh, help with getting these put in. Uh, construction is supposed to start uh, this fall and we hope to have them ready by the end of, uh, end of the year. The Cochrane Basin Storm Rider Project. That's been going on in our neighborhood for three summers now. Uh, this kind of equipment's been around tearing up streets, um, moving stuff around. We're in our final summer. We're looking forward to getting it finished. Uh, as you know, TJ Meenak is all tore up right now, which is creating some traffic problems, but um, I, we all recognize the importance of this project. We're just glad to have it done so that we can finally move on and get our neighborhood streets back together. Most of that will be bringing stuff down into the downriver area. And I want to finish talking about the downriver area. Talked about a lot of great things that are going on in our neighborhood. Um, there are some not so great things going in the downriver area, and our neighborhood council has been struggling with those. Um, as with most neighborhoods, we're dealing with a homeless problem in our green spaces. We're fortunate to have this space, uh, the connection to the river, the connection to Riverside State Park. But We've seen a huge increase in homeless camps, overnight parking there. Um, obviously, with the closing of Camp Hope, these folks had to go somewhere, and they're filtered into all the neighborhoods. But I've lived in this neighborhood for 20 years. Uh, I spend a lot of time down there, and this summer has really been tenfold compared to what we're used to down there. Um, the thing that's most disturbing is it, typically when people camped there, they were tense. They weren't doing, you know, they were leaving trash, but these folks, they don't really have as much regard for this place as as they used to. They're digging out huge platforms to uh, pitch their tents on. They're cutting down trees to build shelters. We're really seeing a lot of damage down there, and it's of great concern to us. Um, we've got people that are going down there. I, I wipe there all the time. I used to see a lot of folks down there, and I don't see them anymore because people don't feel safe going down there. I've been verbally threatened uh, several times down there, so has my wife and so have other people. So it's really becoming a big problem for our neighborhood. 
When they leave, unfortunately, this is kind of what we, what's left over. Um, code enforcement does respond to our requests when we, when we ask them to, but typically this is what's left over when, we're, when we are forced to clean up. On the right-hand side is a cleanup that was done shortly after camps were vacated by code enforcement, but basically, you know, they pick up around the camps. This stuff is scattered all over the place. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what we're trying to do to advocate that. But this is our biggest fear. We've had fires down there every year the last three years. We just had one this spring. I was talking to a neighbor this morning. He drove through down river. There was a campfire burning down there at about 9.30. With the winds the way they are, this area is drying out. It's only a matter of time before we have a major fire down there. And this is my biggest concern. It's the thing that really keeps me up at night. There's also a lot of dumping. Um, you know, some of it's trash. The one on the right is basically left over from a construction project. Somebody remodeled a, a bedroom or a bathroom or a kitchen, all kinds of stuff there. There's a lot of abandoned vehicles dumped there. It's, it's a prime area for that. There's nobody around there at night, so it's, it's, it's a problem area for that kind of stuff. So what do we do about it? Here's what the neighborhood is doing. We've assumed responsibility for moving all graffiti in that area. ONS and code enforcement have provided, provided us with the paint, with the uh, brushes, the poles, all that kind of stuff. We've taken responsibility. Our goal is to try to clean graffiti up within 48 hours of it occurring. And we've noticed that since we've started doing that, it has, it has diminished. There's not as much graffiti as there used to be because we're staying on top of it. The other thing we're doing is trying to submit the legal camping permits as soon as possible so that you know it is a complaint-driven process. We try to get those things in right away, patrol it two or three times uh, a week, and try to get those reports in as soon as possible. Um, and then organize cleanup events, because as I mentioned, you know, code enforcement does come in, they clean up around the campsites, but there's still a lot of garbage down there. So these are things that we feel like we can do to try to mitigate the situation down there and to save our bluff. As far as what we're looking for from the city, I'm working with the parts department to try to reinstall some of the boulders along some of those pullouts along the river. These are boulders that were existing there before. People have pushed them out of the way with their cars. People have dug underneath them to get them to fall down into the bank just so they can get a place to park there. And I'm working with parks now to see if we can get some of those boulders replaced to just mitigate some of that parking along there. And then just you know, enforcing legal, illegal camping ordinance. What I'm finding is you know, there's a camp, that first camp I showed you has been there three weeks. It's been sitting there. I know code enforcement is overworked, but by the time they clean this camp out and evict them, I'll come down two weeks later, and that same person is camped 50, 100 yards away down the river and stuff. So it's just a hopscotch thing. And what the answer is there, I don't know, but I think there are repeat offenders who are really the problem. I don't have as much problem with a lot of those people that are parking next to the road and stuff like that, because a lot of those folks are there at night, they leave, they don't leave a mess, but there are some really bad offenders. Yes, we have your one minute warning. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so those are the things we're trying to do. We're looking for help from the city. Um, and I'm ready for questions or comments. Good timing, go ahead. Jeff, have some of have some of those boulders been reinstalled yet? Because I have had not. heard that that was happening. Uh, not to my knowledge. I've been by there recently, and they've been okay. down there. I'm working with Carl Strong at Parks. Um, okay. I think part of the problem is just getting the equipment down there. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, this is a great update. Thank you so much. I think the community garden is great. I think it's so cool how you involved a lot of the community uh, uh, different groups. I thought having the Shadle uh, woodworking group, the, the wood shop there, putting those beds together is awesome. Um, as, as a father of a three-year-old uh, who just recently started taking him on walks, I'm starting to realize how big of a deal sidewalks are uh, when I didn't know it because I drove everywhere, but now I'm walking a lot more. I, I totally see that. I'm glad to see that you're getting some significant sidewalk um, investment there. And then also love that you guys are, are stepping up and removing the graffiti, and I totally agree. Uh, that the more and more, the, the more you stay on top of it, the less and less you're going to see because it gets annoying for the people doing the graffiti as they're wanting to leave their tags and then the tags don't stay up here. So I think it's great. I appreciate what you're doing. Thanks for giving us the update. Any other questions? Can I, <clears throat> go ahead. I just want to call out Jeff and Fran, who is the um, president. You're, you're still the president. Yeah. Fran, so these two Fran, could you stand up? Stand up for, there we go. That's These Fran. two individuals have done so much for the Audubon neighborhood. They have been around a long time. They're very dedicated. They believe in what they're doing. And if anybody 
watching or anybody in the audience wants to learn about how to create a really successful um, neighborhood council, these two are your people. Um, they just, they work with big hearts and they do a great, great job. So thank you for all you do and, and uh, for your patience with the city as we get through some of these hard times. I appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate thank you, your time and all you do. Good evening, Council. My name is Amber Gross, she, her, with the Office of Neighborhood Services. I have the privilege of introducing our next Council, uh, which is Brown's Edition. We have a really dynamic team who are here to talk a little bit about their Neighborhood Council tonight. Um, this evening, we're, we have um, Vice Chair Dave Williams and Chair Tiffany Picot. Welcome. Hello, hello? Okay, really gotta get close here. Okay, so I'm Tiffany Picot, um, she, her pronouns. You gotta get closer. Oh, sorry, I'm Tiffany Picot, I use she, her pronouns. My name is Dave Williams, I'm the vice chair of our neighborhood And you've gotta get closer too. My name's Dave Williams, I'm vice chair of our neighborhood council in Brown's edition. So I'm not sure how much um, you all are familiar with Brown's Edition, maybe some more than others, um, but this is just some of the information that um, we were able to get from the Office of Neighborhood Services, who we dearly love. Um, we are a tiny little geographic neighborhood, but we are the most densely populated, and we are a very diverse neighborhood. Um, we also are a local historic district. Um, so this is just a little blurb, we don't have to read it all, but we are um, really diverse in terms of socioeconomic class and we are really, really proud of that. Um, we try to be as inclusive as we can be and that's one of my personal goals um, as in my first year as chair is to work towards increasing um, folks on the council. So um, we meet on the third Thursday of every month except for July and August when we are really busy with our summer activities. Um, we are lucky to meet in the MAC, in the Museum of Arts and Culture, um, which is a beautiful space. Um, we have um, many folks that sit on our executive committee that put in hours and hours of work, as well as the folks that um, work through the Friends of Coeur d'Alene Park that are constantly working towards bettering our park. We have subcommittees, um, and we have strong partnerships. Our partnerships are I think what makes Brown's Edition so successful. Our partnerships with STA, we just got to celebrate that on Saturday, which was amazing. Um, our partnership with Friends of Coeur d'Alene Park, our partnership with the MAC, with our local shelters. Um, and I just really wanna point that out that Brown's Edition works with a lot of folks to be as great as, as we are. Um, so we've had, um, this was supposed to happen in March, so looking at last year, 2022, we had two cleanup events, um, 27 disposal passes um, were given out, and um, we're looking to hold a cleanup in the fall as well, a roll-off event. So um, continuing to fund that program is really helpful for our neighborhood councils, especially for Brown's edition, um, so appreciate that. Um, also, mobile speed back, uh, speed feedback results. Um, we had one at 2nd Avenue near Cannon Street, one at Cannon Street near 3rd, and Spruce Street near 4th Avenue. So last year, we had the 25th anniversary of the summer concert series. Um, we were really excited, we really kicked it up. Our concert coordinator, Annie Matlow, really got aggressive with seeking out sponsors and we were able to hold the biggest concert series that we have had um, in terms of um, being able to bring in big bands that are well known, um, being able to compensate bands um, fairly. Um, and this year we are in our 26th year. Um, I do wanna say that we, um, our former uh, chair, Rick Biggerstaff, did step out of that role this past year. We did honor him um, for his years of service and he continues to just be such a support. So I did just wanna include um, a big thank you to him um, from the council and from pretty much everybody I think that works with him. He's just fabulous. And then our list, I think, is short on priorities this year. Um, the, the park, park improvements, um, getting folks energized around the park. Um, that is 
a huge part of almost everything we do. Most of our conversations are around the park um, and that really has informed kind of what we have spent our time on this year. Um, our second priority is around relationships and membership development, um, which goes back to kind of that idea of bringing in more folks to the, to the council, diversifying our council, um, bringing in more renters. We are 86% renter occupied, yet we have very few of those renters that come to our meetings and engage with us on a regular basis. So that part is really key. Um, also, um, bringing in new leaders. Um, Okay, happenings. So the Spokane Neighborhood Leadership Academy is up here because I did it. I did just wanna put in a plug and say that for those of us that were one of the 16 that um, completed that program this year, it was extremely helpful. There were multiple chairs um, that served or that um, participated in the program and for us, especially for those of us that it was our first year in the chair role, it was incredibly helpful. Um, so I would personally, just ask that um, Spokane continues to, to support that program and keep it going. It's only in its second year, but I think what we're seeing is already um, wonderful things from that program even after just two years. And I think we'll continue to see more investment from folks if we invest in them first. Um, our farmer's market, yay. So the farmer's market, the Spokane farmer's market moved to um, the Coeur d'Alene Park. Um, this season, we, were, we, op we welcomed them with open arms. We've been very happy to have them there. It's been fabulous for our residents, for our, um, our guests to come into the park and learn about Brown's Edition. Um, I have been volunteering on Saturdays and learning how to use the EBT system and the WIC program and um, the, the Kernel program. I just worked that last Saturday. Um, and it is amazing how many residents are able to take advantage of those programs who didn't know they existed. Um, and so I just, again, um, those are really important programs to our residents in a densely populated neighborhood like Brown's Edition. Um, having access to healthy food is critically important. The City Line launch um, happened on Saturday and we were all there. It was great. Um, we're really excited to have the City Line. As I said, our partnership with STA has been um, a very long partnership. Rick Biggerstaff gets a lot of um, credit for working um, with folks over at STA. Um, Carl and um, Carly, he has great relationships with them. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the modification of the shelter tops, um, there has just been a, the art, just including the neighborhoods in that process, um, even if sometimes we have to push to make that happen, um, ultimately I think we're all really happy with um, what we were able to like come to an agreement on with that. Um, and then Friends of Coeur d'Alene Park fundraising. Lemonade stands pretty much everywhere. <laughs> if there's an event in Brown's Edition, there's a lemonade stand there. Um, neighborhood tours, we have dedicated folks that are giving tours. Um, and then we're having a benefit concert um, September 10th um, for the park. Um, so if you haven't been to one of our summer concerts, come and come to the benefit in um, September. Am I missing anything else? No, I think it's just some questions. No, okay, great. thank you. <clears throat> Any questions? Go ahead. So I'm talking again. Um, as everybody knows, we had redistricting this past year, so your council members changed. And Council Member Zappone and I now attend your meetings. And I just wanna thank you for being so kind and so welcoming, um, so comfortable. It's nice to, um, I look forward to getting to know the neighborhood better as a new representative. So thank you, and thank you always for laughing at my jokes when I tell them. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Goodness. Thank you, council member. Uh, prior to the change in districting that occurred earlier this year, uh, there was a lot going on in Brown's edition. Uh, probably the biggest thing that occurred over the last few years was getting the designation as an historic district. That makes a huge difference in terms of the kinds of development that can take place in our neighborhood. And we are not against development. We want development, but we want development that reflects the character of our, our neighborhood because it is Spokane's first neighborhood and it is historic neighborhood. We also want to thank right tonight the representation that we had from Council Member Kinnear at the time, who was so helpful at that, and Council Member Wilkerson, 
but we also welcome new representation uh, by Council Member Stratton and Council Member Zappone. It's been good to have you at our meetings. I think you find that when you come to Brown's edition, it's a pretty well attended meeting. Yes. We usually have 25 to 30 of our neighbors that join us in the efforts around there, and we're very grateful for that. And we're glad to have you there to see it. You're doing good work. Great. Thank you both. I was just gonna say, I'm still a resident of Brown's edition, so I just gotta get to a neighborhood council meeting. But over the years, since I have been in that neighborhood since 1976, um, have just seen it evolve, but the consistency has been the involvement of the neighborhood council. Yeah. Just truly impressed at the outreach and how welcoming Browns is um, because I have a mental health facility there, how Browns has embraced populations um, from the mentally ill to the shelters uh, and have welcomed them into that community in a very compassionate way and it's been absolutely moving and those folks felt it in Brown. So just thank you for really showing a neighborhood that says we know we have a part to play as well in how we take care of the people in our city. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Appreciate all you do. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a request, Patrick, from Councilmember Stratton. We have um, Liz Marlin, who's West Central, mm -hmm. and she's got two small children. Wonder if she could go next. Sure. Okay. And they're being really, really they're being good. really good. But so good. You know, yeah. we know like how perfect. riveting this is for kids. So. <laughs> Thank you. I believe your littlest constituent uh, is, I, I believe we call that can't hang. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I am Liz Marlin. I am uh, a volunteer with the West Central Neighborhood Council. Um, of course, we have welcomed uh, new chair and uh, members of the executive committee, but uh, they, they sent me in their stead. So I, I'm happy to present what we've got going on. Um, we had some really big stuff happening as far as the uh, return of in-person neighborhood cleanup events. And our thanks to the, the city and the community assembly for uh, uh, bringing these back in person again. This year's event, we hauled away almost 20 tons of trash and compost from the West Central neighborhood in one day. Um, we had a ton of volunteers there. Uh, they were really moving fast. Big thank you to everybody involved, all of the neighborhood volunteers and also our new neighbors at Hat Trick Brewing um, actually showed up in force, brought their entire staff over and uh, I don't think I've ever had my car unloaded that fast <laughs> on a cleanup day. So it's good to see our, our businesses and our community members pitching in together. Um, it was also, uh, I, I would call this an, Oh, we've, my slides are in complete different order. I apologize, y'all. Um, we also had a, a very, very musical cleanup day with the El Mercadito Market event, um, which, okay, so we're missing some slides. That's all right. Well, it's a live show, folks. We're here for it. Uh, our, our neighbors, so Latinos in Spokane, host their El Mercadito event every last Saturday of the month. So we had a fabulous cleanup event this year with lots of excellent music. Um, they also do a food distribution. It's a, a wonderful cultural event um, to provide support for our Hispanic and Latino neighbors um, who need access to resources, who have different programs available, and then do a food distribution there as well. So that was uh, a fabulous thing that happened also on the same day as cleanup day. So busy activity around AM Cannon Park. Um, we also had a fabulous uh, neighbor day this year as well. Big thanks to West Central Community Center for putting that on, bringing all of our community partners together uh, through Whitworth University, Spark Central, um, Growing Neighbors. We had face painting happening, live music. Um, we had drummers from the community school there. And again, just post pandemic, these opportunities to get together as part of a community, they're they're really irreplaceable. Um, and big thanks as well to the city for allowing the Neighborhood Council to sponsor events like these so we are not dealing with the extra expense of trying to activate our public spaces. Um, this is one of those programs that not only pays for itself in activating our parks, but also helps us co to connect resources in the community as well. Uh, we also uh, took advantage of the... Um, 
community assembly civic engagement grants. Um, we hosted a movie night in the park and also had funding for our welcoming new neighbors bags. Uh, we have our welcome committee got together. They have distributed 350 welcome kits. Uh, and those are all including um, not just the really cute little bag and information about our council and some magnets and a few other odds and ends, but also lots and lots of things from our community businesses that are contributing to let people know what we have going on there. Um, they have coupons and free giveaways, just welcoming people into our neighborhood and encouraging folks as they get to West Central to get engaged and find out more about what we've got going on. Uh, our neighbors at the Native Project as well have started a really big project. Uh, that is the groundbreaking ceremony for their new youth wellness center that is going to be going in over across from AM Cannon Pool. Um, that is a big four-story building, and they are going to be offering uh, youth counseling, substance use and treatment programs, um, pediatric care, uh, the different community resources as well. They're going to have a cultural space for dancing, drumming, singing spaces, um, really bringing the whole community together in support of, of including uh, obviously our, our native community, but also uh, really that urban health footprint that the Native Project celebrates and, and supports. So we are very excited to see what they're accomplishing over in their corner of the neighborhood as well. Um, within that area, we also have our West Quadrant TIF project and really big thanks to the council for putting the funding forward on uh, our proposed West Quadrant TIF implementation planning. Um, this is something that's unique and really unprecedented in West Central, um, where we are engaging in a collaborative co-design process with REACH West Central, Sp uh, West Central Neighborhood Council and Spokane City staff. Um, so this is a community-led collaborative process of trying to identify the projects that are most important to us and start some implementation planning. We want to get things shovel ready, ready to go. So as we identify funding sources, we can connect them to a strategic investment plan as opposed to piecemeal here and there, right? Um, it's so important that planning and development is something that's done with the community and not to the community. So we're here to support city staff and we appreciate their support in working together on this. And thank you again to council for helping put your money where your mouth is for West Central. Uh, West Central, of course, we like to call it Best Central. Uh, it is good to have the Bloomies back and a lot of really fun events happening. Um, we had, of course, our uh, back-to-school community gathering in Dutch Jake's Park for our, our, our fall picnic. We'll be doing that again this year. Um, and we, we have a lot of fun on Bloom's Day, as you can see. Um, we also have a pretty hefty community gardening footprint, uh, so our, our resident livestock chickens there. And... Uh, you know, different community events that are happening throughout. So we just really strongly encourage folks to reach out, get involved, whatever you're passionate about, we've got, we've got a project for you. Um, I've been saying it a long time, many hands make light work. I've got the West Central Neighborhood Council uh, Entertainment Committee back here with me. They have shown up with me, but if there's anybody who's, you know, wants to do something good in their neighborhood or feels like someone had ought to go fix that, um, show up, <laughs> we've got a job for you. <laughs> uh, please, by all means, come visit us and we'll see what we can do to put your project forward. So that said, uh, I do always like to take a little time to say thank you, and I know I'm forgetting lots and lots of people, but thank you to our planning department with the city for co coordinating with us. Uh, thank you yet again to the Northside Streets crew uh, for their speedy, speedy pothole filling, and uh, thank you to council for your investment in our neighborhood. We, we keep trying to give back as much as we get, and uh, just really proud to be a part of this. So, any, what questions do you have? Questions? Go ahead. Liz, you're you're talking wanna, an awful lot tonight. I just, yeah, I just, <laughs> She's got questions. I just want to thank you and the whole, the whole neighborhood council. It is so nice to see uh, West Central thriving, and it really is. And it's got energy. It's got passion. There are people leading the way, and I am so looking forward to see the work that's going to happen and what that end result's gonna be because it's gonna be fabulous. We're and, rising and ready to do great things right here. Thank you for allowing, allowing me to be part of it. It's been a joy. It's a, it's a pleasure. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate I won't go all into you tax increment financing this time. Yeah. There you go. Okay, so Patrick, should we resume our, resume our uh, schedule with yes. um, Comstock?
Thank you so much, Liz. Um, Tiffany and Dave as well. Uh, next up, we have another amazing neighborhood leader presenting, um, Jeff Mergler from the Comstock Neighborhood Council. Good evening, Council. I'm the newly minted chair of the slightly dramatic, never boring, I'll stop there, Comstock Neighborhood Council. I'm going to go off script because, uh, a little bit off script because I think my notes are probably not even close. Oh, cool, we're, we're in sync. Um, first of all, I want to just say that the new guy, Patrick, has been super helpful, and um, I've really enjoyed working with him so far. And uh, being new, he's been very av available for new ideas, and he's been awesome. So uh, speaking of drama, one of the thing, one of the, the big things that happened in 2022 was the speed limit on high drive. So we got through that. We sent a resolution down to you folks, and it appears to be working. I'm happy to report for the most part. Um, to me personally, it feels right. The speed limit as is feels right. But we still have some aggressive driving that goes on. And I'm really looking forward to these speed cameras that we nominated because I think they could have a really good effect in this particular location. And I will circle back to that again, be a little bit of a repetitive theme. Um, but we, we could use some more uh, enforcement with any patrol cars that happen to be able to be d uh, dedicated to that area and also Comstock Park um, is, is problematic as well. So those two locations in particular, we did a nom nomination for the speed cameras and we're looking forward to their installation. Thank you for voting yes on those tonight. Uh, the traffic calming workshops, we had moderate turnout. Um, I would have liked to see better, but I was happy to see that we had a good, good chunk of people um, go to them and give feedback. And I think the feedback was fairly spot on and the solutions that, were, that we came up with and with the help of uh, the city I think are also gonna be quite beneficial. So speed humps being part of this toolkit uh, is going to be a great addition to the area around Comstock, which I believe was recently an area where there was a hit and run accident. And also um, on West 37th, which is quite wide and gets a lot of traffic, there's gonna be apparently speed humps put there as well. We do have a bunch of requests for crosswalks that were put in to the mix and it looks like um, a good chunk of them are also getting put in so we really appreciate that as well and speaking of crosswalks there was a kind of a, a crosswalk snuck in on the Bernard Street traffic info project so I'd like to thank our council members for their support on that so the elephant in the room so this is the common theme at our, all of our meetings and we spend a lot of time on it, which um, is surprising because a lot of it is very downtown focused, but we still spend a lot of time talking about the crime situation in Spokane. Um, homelessness is brought up a lot, the petty crime, the package theft, the catalytic converter theft, fuel theft. Um, anecdotally, it feels like it's getting better. Um, in 2022, I think it was pretty bad. Uh, I think the, pol the remarks from the police have said, the police representative, the representatives that have come into our meetings have supported uh, the fact that it seems to be getting better. Um, but the residents, it's a common theme, it's over and over. We'd spend all this time, we spend 30 minutes talking to our police representative in, in our meetings and it takes up the time of just doing Comstock business. So just so you know. <laughs> So uh, looking ahead, so I'm the new guy. Um, I'm trying to get a team around me. I don't want to do this forever. I'd like to have help and I have some really good people helping me in, in unofficial capacities, but nobody will accept a, 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 a full position. So um, I have a great person that sends out notification named Gretchen and I have the help of the former chair that gives me some good advice. Patrick has been great as I said and we have a fella named Phil who does our minutes, but nobody wants to take those positions and get voted into them efficiently. It's just me, I'm the only person that's voted in as chair. My hope and my focus is succession. I want to have some people 
backfill me when I get out of here. So that's one of the things I'm working on. We are very looking forward to the speed radar, radar cameras throughout our neighborhood, and that has been a lot of focus. It did get a little bit of pushback from some of our residents, but for the most part, it was people were very supportive of it. Um, I think bringing up a couple of other areas in the country and around the world where they're actually used to, to really good effect um, helped. Um, I personally have seen them work really well in Europe to my travels there and some situations in Florida, for example, they've worked really well. And so that was that we did successfully nominate some locations and we were very happy with that. Um, Move Fitness coming into Albertsons, that's great. That is a eyesore in our neighborhood, so a resident in, uh, in that building will be fantastic. And then we have an Avista project that we're working closely with Avista and Friends of the Bluff and we are actually having a, um, an open house with the Friends of the Bluff and Avista on uh, August 9th at the Women's Club on Maple. So all residents can all come out and see what's going on with that project. And that's all I have, so thank you. Well, Jeff, thank you. Any questions, comments? Just thank you for stepping up. My pleasure. Ditto, thank you. Okay. okay. Um, I'd like to just add that Jeff is really doing a great job in stepping up and <laughs> loving it. Great. Sorry, okay. I do have one thing to add. Uh oh, we Sorry. have one thing. One thing, real quick. So uh, I'm on the park board, and we did get to see um, a presentation on this uh, project that Avista is doing on the bluff. Did you see the spider machines that they, I the did. spider con, yeah, pretty cool. excavators, pretty cool. Yeah. That was it. We're yeah. very happy to see that. Okay, great. Uh, next person up is Doug Trudeau, who is a great advocate for the neighborhood, and he is the chair of East Central Neighborhood Council. Thanks for having me and uh, letting East Central present on the neighborhood. And good ideas before me, so I just want to recognize, you know, Sam Mace is our vice chair, Debbie Ryan with CA, and uh, Kim Cumpracker does the secretary, and then Randy McGlynn does a lot with us on IT, or IT so we can have Zoom at our meetings, otherwise it would not go well. So, um, and I guess I push a button here. So kind of an overview of the East Central neighborhood. It's kind of a mix of business and residential, probably half and half. Um, a lot of commercial industrial manufacturing, and we should say education, because we do have the uh, Southview District there. Um, and then distinct neighborhoods with Sprague Union, South Perry, and Fifth Avenue. So, um, you know, last year we saw the completion of the new medical college next to us, and then it's home to all these universities there, Eastern, Gonzaga, Spokane Community College. I mentioned them because I went there, to all of them, those three anyways. And then um, last year we had come online the uh, boxcar apartments. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of affordable housing projects have been done in our area, Catholic Charities, Community Frameworks, East Central Community Organization, which everybody calls ECHO. But anyways, so that's that way. Uh, so we do believe there should, you know, we, there's a need for home ownership in there, which would bring wealth to the neighborhood and those types of things. So we'd like to see an increase in home ownership and marketplace apartments and housing options. So, um, you know, on the commercial side, you know, we saw a completion of Playfair uh, 14. <clears throat> you know, there's a belief in the private sector that probably we didn't seize advantage of doing more development in our areas during COVID um, to see more of that just because the permitting process took a while. So we think that uh, there could have been more opportunity there if things would have been in place, but nobody thought COVID was going to come. So, uh, transportation projects. Um, you know, we finally saw the completion of the Trent Bridge, which was kind of neat to be there last week uh, with the opening. And then the uh, fourth or couplet was mostly done last year, but they're doing some finish work this year. And luckily, there wasn't a lot of disruptions this year as much as last year. So, and we kind of put this presentation together back in February, so we actually now have a final plan for I-90 with the connection to the freeway, and, and I think they did a good job, the, the state uh, working with us and those types of things. I think we got a pretty good result. Um, completion date, say 2030, I don't know, hopefully they can stay on place with that. Um, you know, Magnolia Pres uh, Pedestrian Bridge, they talked, the state talked about having some kind of detour route, but it'd be nice to get follow up with that and uh, see some follow through on their part to do that so that we get that. So we'll continue to work on that. And then, um, you know, there's always a park replacement north of the freeway. They removed a small park. Some people would like to see maybe a CSO tank, use that CSO tank behind Zips as an option. 
So we continue to work forward with that. Um, um, you know, because of COVID and those types of deals, I don't know how long this presentation was there, but you know, the, you know, the city itself invested a lot in our community with the Liberty Park Library and the Hive. Those were completed over the last couple of years. Um, major road projects, they finished Sprague Avenue, Sprague 2, that part between Shermanish and uh, Division, which is nice, so thank you. And then uh, Thorn Frey, we already talked about. And then grind and overlays and various roads, including Second Avenue, which, which was, anyway, so that's done. So, um, you know, we believe the uh, relocation of the police precinct to the former East Central uh, Library is a positive step forward. Uh, and I think that's been a good result associated with that. It's made a safer environment for the neighborhood and the, the surrounding businesses and, and activities that are going along there. So, um, you know, we, we, the legal camp near I-90 obviously has been closed. We, it, at the time when we put this together, it wasn't. Um, but, you know, we did see there's some side effects. Obviously, property insurance has doubled, tripled, or even been canceled for people. Uh, and there's a lot of concern by property owners with decreased value in properties. Um, Anyways, I, I don't want to spend as much time on that, but this this has had a real negative impact on those surrounding communities in that neighborhood. Uh, and so, um, the new disc golf course was a great idea for Liberty Park. It's really brought a lot of people in there. Um, I know they're redoing the sprinklers this year, so hopefully that'll be done soon, or they're redoing them. And then uh, the city has uh, done a very good job of getting us new playground equipment in several of the parks. You know, Grant's getting some. Liberty's getting some, so thank you for that effort to get that to happen. Um, and then we look forward to continuing to have a community engagement process with Underhill Park. I know some things came up there, and you, everybody listened there, so we appreciate that. So thank you. Community events, uh, Spring on the Ave actually uh, did very well this spring. So it was the first one they did this year, and they actually had really good attendance, so I say it that way. Um, we were able to take advantage of the programs with the cleanup program this, you know, this spring. And uh, I think we're gonna have some stuff, actually some stuff will happen this fall as well. So, and then uh, South Perry Ferry Fair happened on July 15th. And then uh, very quickly, we're gonna have the Sierra Camp uh, event on August 12th, Saturday. So we look forward to that event. And then, sorry, just gonna come back here. You know, um, one of the things that the, um, you know, with focus on community engagements, obviously taking advantage of the community programs and the stuff that's been put forward to us. We want to continue to increase participation in our, our community program and rebuild that as we go forward. So, and then a slide kind of got taken out of here, but I just want to, you know, we did, you know, uh, where am I at with this stuff? So real quick, you know, unfortunately the last couple of our community leaders in our area was Sandy Williams, so that was disappointing. Very great person for us. And then uh, Ivan Bush passed away recently too. Yeah. There's a you know, good leader inside of the neighborhood. Questions? Questions? Go ahead, Go Council Member Wilkerson. Well, first of all, thank you, Doug. And there is a lot going on in the East Central neighborhood uh, that's extremely positive. I guess I, we've always, and I say we because I live in East Central, been challenged about participation in the neighborhood council with that division of the interstate. You got folks on the south side of the freeway and folks on the north side. Has there been any really, working with Office of Neighborhood Services, a really a, a, a outreach plan as to how to bring those folks in? Because it feels very, sometimes it's like, it's not run by the neighborhood, it's run by the businesses. And that's... Yeah, you know, well, and being that it is half business, it's kind of right. different. And then you do have a real strong sense up by the, and it's done by the businesses in Perry. Right. The businesses are kind of running that. So you're right, right. and it's segmented. And you have good participation in the Sprague right. Union. But it's kind of weird because it's not all together. Yeah. I think the, you know, the, you know, we didn't talk about the community center, but I think more involvement mm -hmm. back into that. And, you know, COVID hurt that, you know, mm -hmm. participation there and people getting the community and that. It's going to take a while to grow it back, but I'm optimistic it will. And I do agree yeah. with you. There's a lot of different working pieces all over the place. It'd be nice if they came together better. That, that, I think at some point there have been conversation about East Central being East Central because you do have ESBA, you got the University District, you got the Perry District. But they're all in the footprint of East Central, yeah. um, but they're very unique in, in, their, in what they do and the approach that they take. So I look forward to maybe that conversation as to how we go forward with that, but all the other opportunities. And the city told me from the Magnolia Bridge crossing, Washtock committed to paving 4th Avenue on oh, the good. south side and Pacific on the north side as, um, as a gift to us. And it's supposed to be completed by
by the end of September. And that's a, a sidewalk improvements, ADA accessible on those streets. So that'll be in the interim while we're getting the Magnolia Bridge yeah. overpass. Then. Thank you. And those will be long-term investments so it'll yes. stay there for a long time, yes, which is will. good. So. Anybody else? All right, Doug, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug. Next up, we have longtime leader, current chair, and Spokane Neighborhood Leadership Academy mentor, E.J. Ionelli, with the Emerson Garfield Neighborhood. No? Okay. Well, we might be skipping to the next. Would he be on Zoom? Is he Zoom? No. Okay. Well... It, okay. it looks like another one of our fantastic neighborhood chairs is up next. Um, Carol Tomsick from Lincoln Heights. Welcome. Okay, I took a lot out of my presentation to make it a good short one. So, <laughs> but I do appreciate all the council members. Let me get my glasses on. Okay, the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council holds regular meetings in person every other month at the Southside Community Center from 6 to 7.30. We also have continued to hold Zoom meetings on the other months. We usually have three speakers on three subjects that affect our neighborhood. Our council has 22 eligible voting members. We post our meeting notices on social media and send out email, noti email meeting notifications. We have neighbor neighborhood news section in our meeting notifications to keep our residents updated. The cleanup program is a coveted program in our neighborhood. We had a two-day curbside pickup in 2022. The total waste remover was 28.85 tons. 304 disposal passes were used in 2022. This year, 309 disposal passes were requested from residents in our neighborhood. 133 passes were redeemed. The total waste removed from our neighborhood during our spring two-day curbside pickup was 19. 62 tons. We greatly appreciated the distribution list of residents and wanted to be on our email list. Our council passed three resolutions for photo park speed zone cameras. The Hamblin Park resolution was a joint resolution with the Southgate Neighborhood Council. Thank you for approving the sites and we look forward to all the sites in our neighborhood being funded. Our council passed a resolution for a public-private partnership to merge the open space in the Garden District PUD with the city-owned 31st Napa former water tower partial to create a 10-acre park. The park is essential to reduce park service gaps in our neighborhood and it is our hope that the purchase of the partial will be included in the upcoming park levy. Our council is extremely grateful the city denied the Chick-fil-A request for a deviation from the maximum parking limit under the centers and corridor zoning. The denial aligns with our district center plan and the center and corridor intent for safe pedestrian environment. The safety of our residents in our district center is a priority with our council. We appreciate the funding and upcoming installation of an RRFB at the 29th Rosars Crosswalk and the ultimate loop study, traffic study from our cycle 10 traffic calming application. Our council was active and involved in two applications in the 2022-2023 comprehensive plan amendments. We supported the concerns of our residents, including traffic concerns, loss of green space, and the destabilization of an existing neighborhood. Our council made sure our residents were aware of the amendment process. We had Kevin Freebot present on the comprehensive plan amendment process. We also had Greg Francis present on the plan commission process. We got a bicycle greenway on the bike map and the amendments on South Fisk from East 27 to East 35th. We also got a bike map designation ordinance to protect historic access from South Altamont Street and East 33rd. Thank you, Lori. The school district is proposing a streetfication on Fisk between 36th and 37th in their Adams Elementary rebuild, and our council has asked for pedestrian bicycle access prior to the vacation to extend the Fisk Greenway to 37th. Our council has been working on a bicycle route that will connect the Ben Burr Trail to Thornton Murphy Park. I greatly appreciate the work of the engineers on our traffic issues. Our residents have reached out to our council on the safety issues in all five locations. I would like an annual review of the four-year project list in the Traffic Common Program. We need to continue to address all the imminent traffic concerns in our neighborhoods, especially if any of the concerns can be resolved with any of the future grants or funding. 
our council strives to connect with our residents using the community engagement grant. We used a 2022 grant on our Zoom renewal and a booth at the South Perry Street Fair. We also installed two pole banners with our logo and web page address on 29th by the Lincoln Heights Shopping Center. Our council approved our 2023 grant in May. We renew our Zoom. We had a booth at the South Perry Street Fair again on Saturday. We will install two more pole banners on the entrance to Upper Lincoln Park. Our council will also hold meet our council events. Our first location will be Nothing Bunt Cakes from 11 to 1 on 722. We use part of our food grant to purchase Buntinis. We will set up a table on the sidewalk outside the business and meet and greet our residents. Our meeting highlights. Nick Hammond held a dog park community meeting at our October 2022 20, meeting. The park board voted against a resolution selecting Lincoln Park as a location for the dog park. I attended the park board meeting and expressed concern that our council had not received feedback from the workshop prior to the resolution. There were many residents present that commented on the loss of an irreplaceable natural habitat. Our council then passed a resolution to designate up in Lincoln Park as a natural park land. We, added, we asked the Rockwood Neighborhood Council to join us and they passed a similar resolution. Parks is currently working on a city park natural land management plan thanks to the efforts of Spoken Urban Nature, a grassroots group. Our council has stressed that we do not want a land designation that restricts our residents' use of our neighborhood parks. We had Chad Mitchell present on the history of the South Hill Dog Park. His presentation gave our council an understanding of the process that led to Upper Lincoln Park being selected as a dog park. Fiona Dixon presented on the policy for adopt a park and park fringe groups. Kathryn McCarthy, a wildlife specialist at Washington Department Fish and Wildlife, presented on our neighborhood coyote problem. Our council will continue to educate the residents not to feed the wildlife and report coyote bold behavior. Our neighborhood strives to educate our residents on water conservation and recycling. Chris Majors presented on recycling and composting. Kara Odegaard on sustainability. Hilary Sepulveda gave an overview of the Spokane Conservation District. Our neighborhood has experienced an increase in panhandling and homeless camps. Ben Stuckart presented on housing. Nicolette Oakletree reported on initiatives underway to reduce homelessness, offered ways our residents could volunteer. Our neighborhood is primarily single family residents, so our council has been active in keeping our residents informed on the city shape in Spokane housing. Kevin Freebert presented on building opportunity for housing. Our council greatly appreciates Kevin's interaction with our residents. He has accepted our invitation to speak on the subject many times. Sergeant Teresa Fuller educated us on the use of crosswalks. She said vehicles are required to stop for pedestrians at all crosswalks, marked or unmarked. And I skipped down to, we had a successful 2022 Meet Your Neighbors in the Park. We are busy working on our third annual Meet Your Neighbors in the Park. It is 819-23 from 11 to 1 at Thornton Murphy Park. And I have a lot more to say, but that's all I could add in the time I was given. Well, you, you did well. You've you got two, well. okay. two Go minutes and 42 seconds Good. to spare. Okay. Good job. Questions from... Mr. Bingo. Okay, you can't talk about a neighborhood coyote program or a problem and not, I mean, okay, so my grandparents owned a cattle farm up in Stevens, right? Uh -huh. And so we dealt with coyotes a certain way out there. You can't exactly do that in the city of Spokane. And so I'm assuming that if you have a problem, this isn't like, we saw a coyote once. Oh, no. But, like, it's a regular thing. Can you uh, just expand on that? What we were told is it was we, it's in Upper Lincoln Park. It's on some of the private residences that they're prolific breeders. So if you go in and try to kill them, that's not going to solve your problem. But if they find out there's no food, their litters get smaller, and then we eventually control the population. So, yeah, they're seen as far as Hamblin Park, and we've had quite a bit of sightings. And... The only thing you really have to worry about is they're afraid of humans, but if they have bold behavior, that has to be taken care of right away. So, yeah. Are people feeding them? Oh, yeah. If you leave your dog food out for your dog, they will come in. Oh. They're very good at getting over fences, so you have to put those rolling fences up. Oh. And they um, like small animals, yeah. so you really have to be careful. Cats. I was about to say, not just the dog food, but the dogs sometimes. The dogs yeah. Themselves. yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're smart. Yeah, so it was interesting, and, and Rockwood Retirement has, the, it's kind of centralized around them, so she came and talked to them too. So hopefully we have neighbors that aren't leaving food out for them. Yeah. Amazing. Go ahead. I just want to thank Carol. I mean, this is one of the neighborhood councils that does a lot of education, as you read off. She yeah. educates that neighborhood, but I did see the banners this yeah, weekend. Yeah, we love her. I was growing across 29th. I thought that Good. was very cool. Uh, to do placemaking of, mm -hmm. of where we're at and all the commitment that you guys have done towards traffic calming. Oh, and yes. I 
will be public. As much as I like Chick-fil-A, I didn't want it on 29th, uh, just for traffic reasons. Uh, yes. So We've worked very, very hard. We've got that RFB coming in, and then a block away, we've got a bicycle greenway. So. And we have bus stops there, and I walk there, and you already get ran over yeah. if you don't watch. So, And we've had cars. seniors hit crossing the street from the apartments. Rosars, yeah, we lost, Rosars. we lost one yeah, so, a couple right. years ago. He got hit by a new driver, mm -hmm. so that made it even worse. So challenging. So yeah. thank, thank you for your commitment. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Sure. I'm okay. still on the Is this your last I, Me too. Yeah, <laughs> I can't get over it. We're still, moved, moved still ruminating on yeah. coyotes. Um, so I just... All my other stuff is I want all of our traffic home and funded. Yes. Thank Absolutely. you, Carol. Great. Thank you. Um, next up, Gail Cooper, who is the vice chair of the Northwest Neighborhood Council, but also serves as the chair of our Community Assembly's Budget Committee, in addition to serving on the Admin Committee and Building Stronger Neighborhoods Committee. Gail is a very busy person. Thank you. Welcome. I stepped on my regular eyeglasses, so I'm going <laughs> to deal with these today. So is this the clicker here? No. no. Uh, you can hit any oh, of those buttons keyboard? on the keyboard. Yep. Okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. I am Gail Cropper. Cooper, Cooper, Capper, Cropper. <laughs> so, but anyway, but thank you. Um, and I'm the vice chair for the Northwest Neighborhood Council. And I'm sorry, is the space button? Uh, yeah, the space bar should work. Okay. So we, oh, excuse me. Uh, you saw the previous picture there. I just wanted to comment. I think our neighborhood looks like um, a cute dinosaur. Oh, <laughs> it does. So, um, so, yeah, here's a picture of our neighborhood um, showing the boundaries. And like I said, it's somewhat in the shape of a dinosaur. And... Next slide, please. Oh, well, here we go. And we're in District 3, Northwest is called, the District 3 is also Northwest. Some people get confused about us being the neighborhood council called Northwest in the large area, but, um, excuse me. And so in our neighborhood, we have parks and attractions. There are the Carson, Loma Vista, and Westgate Park. And we have Dwight Merkel, the large green area, the sports complex that draws a lot of activities. And we're blessed to be near the Riverside State Park. Um, housing extends the, up the Northwest Corridor. So if you follow the dinosaur's neck there, you see up there. And um, that's the West Nine Mile Road, also known as the State Route 291. And unfortunately, there is no bus service or bicycle routes in that growing area. Um, I'm glad you've uh, given me the time for this presentation because I'm hoping this will help us be able to reach out to the residents. We don't have a lot of people in our um, neighborhood uh, in the council, and I'm hoping that people is, are watching this and it helps to encourage them to participate and help us do the activ activities and events that you hear what the other neighborhoods are doing. Uh, the Northwest Neighborhood Council is nonprofit 501c3, it's a corporation. We're our board, uh, we have a chair, vice chair, secretary, treasurer, and a member at large. We have openings for some standing committee members to join us. Anyone can attend our meetings. Voting members must reside in our boundaries and just attend two meetings within 12 months. Uh, members can be leaders with our uh, community assembly or be on a standing committee within the community assembly. And I want to let you know that we meet on the third Wednesday of the month from September through May, except December. We usually about, have about a one and a half hour meeting. It's a great online calendar that's on the website. Thanks ONS for updating that. You can see uh, 
you know, where the meetings are for the different neighborhoods and other uh, committees on here. I just love the website because there's just so much information. We are meeting uh, in person and virtually using Zoom. And we meet at the Brown Elementary School. It shows here on the map the location at 5102 North Driscoll Boulevard. There's plenty of street parking, free street parking. Um, there, although the library that we meet in is up on the second floor, they have a nice elevator. So um, anybody can come to our meetings. And we're hoping that if we get some more people visiting us, maybe we can move into their assembly room get out of the library. Those little chairs. Have you ever sat in those little kiddo chairs? Yes. <laughs> um, oh, here we go. This is our council reps. Hey, Zach, Karen, hey. <laughs> nice to meet you in person today. <laughs> so yeah, you know, they come, uh, they alternate the meetings and they give the report and other information that is the good of our neighborhood. So thank you for doing that. And from ONS, Gabby, she is our liaison, and she, um, she keeps us informed about the programs that, we, that our neighborhood is um, able to participate in. And later through in this presentation, I'll uh, give some reports about those programs. We appreciate when the spoke police officers from the Northwest Precinct can attend and give the reports about crimes that are within our neighborhood or adjoining areas. And they have helped an area um, who, there was concern, a citizen, about abandoned vehicles. So um, thanks to the council member and the police for taking care of that. So last September, we were affected by the city's redistricting. And also, our neighborhood was affected by the redistrict, redistricting by the Spokane Public Schools due to the three new middle schools in the city. Our neighborhood welcomed the new Flett Middle School located the furthest west on Wellesley behind the VA Medical Center and the old Joe Alby Stadium area. We have four elementary schools that the sixth graders will transition into Flett. And then Flett serves the grades six through eight, who will then feed into the Shadel Park High School. Great schools. Um, we had some, uh, you know, keeping track of things that we do every month at meetings. But um, I wanted to report that we had a member who attended the community assembly retreat. It was. October, I'm sorry, I didn't write the date, but the retreat brought together the city neighborhood leaders, ONS staff members, and facilitators from Gonzaga. In November, the Spokane Neighborhood Leadership Academy, also known as SNLA, had information about the five-month program designed for new and emerging NC Council leaders with, um, with knowledge, and we hope that new members may want to be in that program that's coming up. Please, we need, we need new people. <laughs> so time to time, we get uh, calls or emails from residents, and any inquiries might include unleashed pets in the neighborhood. Although they're walking with the owners, the dog actually ran across the road and bit someone. Abandoned vehicles, which um, reported earlier was taken care of. Assistance on yard work, you know, they have someone has disabilities or they don't have the tools to help clean up. So we got a hold of 311 and we were gotten some information to help guide them through that process. Um, also recently the Lyme bikes, uh, there we had a resident complaining that 3 a.m. they had three bikes that were dumped um, in front of their place. They live across from the Merkel uh, that big park, the Merkel, and just south of Francis. So I don't know how far these line bikes go, but it ended up on his sidewalk. And he, he said that it, they hadn't been picked up for days. So I just wanted to let you know that um, I did reach out 
to the person listed as the planner of the program, but unfortunately I didn't hear back from them. Um, there was also requests from our neighbors up in the neck of the dinosaur that crossing that highway there, and they were uh, looking for some type of crossing, but it's a highway, so, you know, I don't know what to do for them on that, but there's concerns about the safety of crossing those roads. Here's the VA Medical Center. I used to visit that often when my husband, we lived like three blocks from there. Um, so the reason I'm mentioning them is they shared information with our neighborhood about volunteerism that they're seeking. And like driving the DAV van, Disabled American Veterans Van, or the little cart, electric carts that they have now that if you park in the parking lot on campus and they'll bring the patients up to the door. Those are types of things that they're looking for. If we have any veterans out there listening, if you'd like to help the other veterans, there we are. Also, uh, they have blood drives. Uh, Vitalant mobile bus comes, walk-ins are welcome. So if you like to donate blood, or if is that something that you do do, um, instead of going down a little further south, just go ahead to the VA Medical Center. Gail? Yes. We have one minute. Okay. Um, so anyway, we uh, renewed our grant for Zoom. We're going to get some printed signage. And we participated in the mobile feed feedback programs, um, the neighborhood cleanup program. Unfortunately, we did not have a roll off because we don't have people to help volunteer to do that. So again, volunteers, we need you to join us so we can do these things. Uh, I got when we last met, 12 voting members. We have about 105 email distribution lists, but that was increased because of the, the passes for the, the trash. And um, we have a couple of Facebooks that I share information with. I even shared about tonight's meeting, so I'm hoping people are tuning in to ch the five, channel five. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Gail, I want to thank you. I, I don't think people realize you have a really busy life, but yet you have stayed strong and you're putting this neighborhood council back together and moving it forward. And um, seriously, some days I see her, I'll walk into a meeting, it'll be early, and she's there with a smile on her face and <laughs> she's ready to go. And it's like she's holding up the whole, the whole world just, you know, to keep those meetings going and to reach out to, to get membership growing. So thank you for that. Yes. And um, tell me, you're talking about the crossing. People are afraid to cross. Up, um, up in the northwest it, area, like the Rifle nine Club mile. Road and the, heading down that way. It's by yeah, the dinosaur's um, neck. By the dinosaurs. I'll just look at the dinosaur's yeah, neck. Yeah, the dinosaur here. neck. Okay. <laughs> Francis, okay. Thank you, Gail. Okay. Appreciate you. Yes, no, no problem. Okay, we have one neighborhood <laughs> left. <laughs> North Hill. Thank you so much, Gail. Um, well, I'm glad to see Fran still in, and Jeff in the back because maybe they can discuss adding some legs to that dinosaur um, and, and maybe recreating some neighborhood boundaries there. Last up, we have got a tremendously dynamic neighborhood council chair, um, and his name is Scott Webb. He's from the North Hill neighborhood. Welcome, Scott. All right, good evening. All right, so uh, just a couple highlights from my neighborhood, just to really kind of brag on what we do and the things we're working on. Um, so for, I think, the third year in a row, we have the uh, Garland Summer Market, which the neighborhood has a booth. Um, last year we did, uh, every week they meet on Thursdays. Um, because of lack of volunteers over the summer, uh, we don't have one every, every week, but we still have somebody manning the booth, answering questions for our neighbors trying to recruit, because as we've all heard tonight, uh, volunteer is down, so everybody just needs more participation from our neighbors, uh, which we're all actively trying to get. 
Um, but it's a, it's a great market. It's still small and growing, um, but I always enjoy going down there and just walking around. All right, so as part of that, we set a booth. Cops has uh, joined us, so uh, usually we have some of their materials as well just to um, emphasize what they do. We don't have a cop shop in our neighborhood exactly. It's actually in Northwest and then across division on the other side, uh, but we do have participation from them because uh, they're surrounding us. All right, um, topics, code and safety issues. So um, with the access to the police department again, since we lost the resource officers, uh, our neighborhood is actually one of the highest crime neighborhoods at the moment, uh, but I know the police department's doing quite a bit to help prevent that and reduce that as much as possible. Um, neighborhood history, so let's talk about our boundaries. Uh, we're actually one of the bigger ones as far as residential goes. We have the Garland District in our boundaries, um, and that's pretty much it for, for most businesses. Uh, we do go from Cora at the bottom of the hill to the south, um, all the way up to Francis, and then from Ash all the way over to Division. Um, so it's pretty extensive. Um, and then as far as uh, people, I, I've taken over the chair. I've been here about a year and a half, but I've been with the neighborhood council for about three years since I moved into the neighborhood. Uh, Dan Brown is the vice. He was the previous chair. Um, and then we have Julie who represents the Garland Business District. And then we took on, we recruited another uh, gentleman named Justin who took over for community assembly. So we are kind of building, it's slow. Um, it would definitely be nice to have more. Um, I heard the other gentleman talking. Um, I don't want to be in this position forever either, so trying to build kind of that leadership foundation so we can get people to do more down the line. Um, All right, so new paths to Franklin Park. Um, so last year, we did uh, extend part of the path on Franklin Park on uh, White House, which has been really nice. As far as I'm aware, we're going to extend it and finally connect an entire path all the way around the park, uh, which will uh, be on the Queen side, so from White House all the way to Division. Uh, much like Clark Park, which is also in our neighborhood, that does have a path that goes all the way around. So Franklin will be um, in addition to that. The nice thing about this, um, we do have three very beautiful and accessible parks in our neighborhood. Um, I know we had the, um, was it Krem that came in and cleaned up the, the uh, baseball fields last year um, in Clark. Um, Ruth is a hidden gem that's really nice and quiet in the back neighborhoods there. Um, but they get a lot of use. We use this one quite a bit uh, with the splash pads. Um, I did meet with Parks. They came to one of our last meetings in May, I think, um, trying to convince them to fix the the uh, tennis courts. All right, uh, so with all the housing stuff that's been talked to about tonight, we have had the Millennium Group. They are gonna build a similar structure on Garland that was just put in Monroe. Um, there was a recent groundbreaking. Um, I will say from just the viewpoint of the council that meets, we were very disheartened not to be invited to this. Uh, we spoke with Millennium extensively. I'm still getting calls from neighborhoods that just found out about this project. Um, so not to be invited or called um, was just very disheartening because we are active. We've been part of this from the beginning. Um, but I can say personally, I, I'm happy to have it come in. I know with some of the businesses, they're excited because it's kind of foundational customers to our neighborhood, which will help boost that Garland business district. Um, all right, zone and land use. Again, this is an ongoing thing with uh, Faith Bible Church, similar to the Millennium Project. Um, I believe you all passed recently. Um, there was a big contention with the height of the building, and I believe you capped it at 50 feet, if I remember. Uh, I think initially we were told 70 or 80, um, but that way it's not even with the bluff, it's just below, so that helps the neighbors that are on the bluff not looking directly at the side of a building instead of losing their beautiful view into downtown. Um. All right, so we've been convening in person. We don't have Zoom, uh, mostly because we don't, I don't think have anybody that's technology uh, savvy enough to do it at the same time. Um, we've been very successful. Our average meeting is about 15 people. Um, 
recently with the issue on the Garland situation during Pride Month, uh, our numbers jumped up quite a bit. Um, but I expect them to go back down to that 15 as we resume back in the fall. And of course, we're on break right now for July and August. We'll reconvene in September. Um, and then we do meet at the Gathering House. Um, they're gracious enough to let us use their space for free, and we meet on the second Thursday of every month, except for the two off the summer. Uh, curbside pickup has been successful for us. We actually apply usually for two, one in the uh, spring, one in the fall. Uh, it was so successful in the spring this year that we have not been able to do it in the fall. Um, and we have found success in the curbside pickup rather than uh, the roll-off events, strictly because we do have a lot of uh, older individuals in our neighborhood that don't have access to bring the garbage to. Um, and so we have it pick up right uh, on their doorstep. Um, I know personally with some of the neighbors around me, I volunteer to go and help move things to their curb if they need it. Um, and like I said, it's successful enough in our, in our neighborhood that we won't be able to do the second one this year. Um, and then Art Alley is always a success in Garland. Um, I know they, they paint, I think it's once a year, twice a year. A part of that is to reduce the graffiti in the alley. Um, and then we do have the cleanup events as well. Um, we just participated in that a couple months ago uh, just to keep it clean, uh, free of garbage. I think we actually dumped a treadmill randomly left in the alley uh, in the last one, uh, but we do our best to keep the neighborhood and that business district as clean as possible. Uh, neighborhood issues and needs. Uh, the bluff, um, this has been brought up a couple times, but uh, just doing our best to try to keep that um, clean and clear. Obviously, it can be a fire hazard. Um, and again, right where that's looking on the sidewalk and the benches, it looks right down here into the city. You can see uh, the skyscape, or excuse me, um, the cityscape. It's a beautiful view. Um, and so I think we've tried to work with parks and just try to get, I saw some gentlemen out there on my run a couple weeks ago. Um, so it is in progress, but maybe replacing some of the benches or, or seeing what we can do to clean it up and make it uh, a little more beautifying, if you will. Uh, traffic calming, um, we participate in those. Um, of the ones that listed, I know the one that we voted as our top um, option is probably one of the most expensive, but I think just like everybody else has mentioned, it's more of a safety concern over price. Uh, but the traffic signals on Rowan and Maple and Ash, so right where the Maple Street Bistro, that Aces, the Pizza, uh, so Papa Murphy's, um, putting traffic signals to actually stop traffic and that will help um, stop just speeding straight down, it will create a natural barrier to stop, so you have to stop and go. Um, I believe, if I remember correctly, that was about $2.2 .2 million to do that. Um, additional to that, we had the traffic circles on Madison. Uh, it's one block uh, west of Monroe. Again, people avoid Monroe, so they'll go over there and speed down the road. So adding, I think, three traffic circles to that will help just slow traffic in, in the residentials. Scott. Yes. Got one minute. All right. Uh, big one on here. I'm actually kind of glad that Emerson Garfield uh, skipped because they probably brought this up as well. But uh, we have been working on the North Hill sign with Emerson Garfield. Um, this has been a thing since I started, not this particular sign, but trying to get a sign into our neighborhood. Um, I know the sign is built. We have asked funds. I know uh, Councilmember Stratton has asked for funds from the city and other community members uh, for the base to put the sign on. Um, but it would be nice if we can get that completed and up and going as soon as possible. Uh, there's current renovation on the uh, Clark Park gazebo underway. Let's see, I already mentioned that. And then, yeah, just safety in neighborhoods and parks. Nothing new out of our neighborhood that is not in any other neighborhood. Um, yeah, I believe that it. And then just kind of thank everybody, including the council members that are involved. Um, big shout out to Amber behind me as our ONS representative. She's very active with our neighborhood, which is amazing. Um, and then, of course, the gathering house uh, that allows us to have meetings. So any questions? Questions? Okay. Thank you for coming down. Yeah. You're a good leader. You do Thank a you. really good job at meetings. Thank you. And I'm working on that gateway 
um, sign. I think we're getting close, but okay. you deserve it. Emerson Garfield and North Hill deserve that sign because they've had to wait so long. So we're working hard to see what we can do to yeah. get some more funding for it. And I know we trust that it will be up at some point. It's yeah. just a matter of when. And which, if anybody has seen the previous ones that came in before this one, this is a significant improvement yeah. on the previous design. And thank you for being so patient. Oh, because yeah. Because it, it rubs off in a meeting. Then everybody yeah. kind of, you know, takes a breath. And um, yeah. But it has been a hassle. But I really appreciate your leadership. Very good. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate you. And uh, to Patrick and ONS, thanks so much for coordinating this. Appreciate that. Uh, council members, anything else before we adjourn? All right, you're all quiet. Wow. Okay, uh, we're going to adjourn. Next meeting is July 24th. What? On, on. Okay, July 24th. Uh, have a great week, and we'll see you then. Thank you. Thanks for your